We say no to the negative energy. The family is very important. We did our part as people. We want them to get along with one another. We want all of our people to get along with one another. Also on behalf of Tukashla, Red Cloud, his Chanupa, his descendants, Spotted Tails, and all the chiefs, the relatives, they know what was done here and looks how you are open to teach up a little. Am I on? Hello, my name is um, Jennifer Martell. Sorry for the emotions, but as a young person, we're supposed to respect our elders and our elders. I'm related to Ivan Orville through their father, Stanley. It feels good because I love my brothers and I know their parents and my mother would be very honored to know that our people are wanting our unity as, as a family. And like Phil said, family is everything. Family is the first. If we don't have that with our older and our elders, then how do we have the teachings and the goodness as young people? There has been a negative energy for a long time. And as a young person, and as a relative, I want no more of it because we've got a lot of work to do. Far from for me and my grandchildren. Thank you for having this done. And I hope now that we can have some peace and we can move forward and continue to teach our young people. I always think about Orville, because there was many times my mom said, when she had cancer, she said, I wish Orville can come, but I know he's doing work. And my mom, my mother is no longer here. So now my place is to get up and speak, because if I don't, then it continues. You come from beautiful people. We're strong people. We're resilient. And we have to forgive one another because we're not perfect. We'll never be perfect. But we have a lot of young people in here that are wanting to learn and wanting to know. So we have to always remember who's sitting next to us or who's in the room because they're watching, they're listening. Thank you. Oh. Okay, uh, <clears throat> the next speaker that we had, he wanted to come up with Cedric Kudaus on Ukpapa Treaty Council. President? Cedric. Oh, Cedric. Goodhouse. Oh. It's all mine, he said, so. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. <clears throat> um. I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to just say a few words about one, about today, we have some people that have, you know, they, they shut everything down. 
schools, everything. Ain't nothing going on back home. It's pretty, pretty bad. They said there's uh, 10, 15 feet snow wood drifts. But we have some people on the horseback coming this way. <clears throat> and those people have never been informed by the plans of the ride. There have been plans made that the Hunkpapa were never made aware of. But if it wasn't for Sinimbu being murdered today by our own people, there wouldn't have been a wounded knee. Today, those, uh, those young men are probably, it, it don't matter what you put on, you still get cold. They've been riding their horses all summer long, I know that. I've seen them, I went down there and visited them from time to time to be out riding their horses along the, up and down the Grand River Valley gathering team sila and various other things, come back on horses. Always good to see. And they were preparing those horses for this ride. And they're gonna make it. There's supposed to be a meeting about the ride tomorrow, next day. We sit in here, we see all these things on the board, all these things, and good information. But I shared with that young lady that from Kansas did, uh, did her presentation. I, I took certain note about a couple of things she said, and I wanted to get some more information. But, <clears throat> It made me reevaluate where we're at as a treaty council back home. Prior to the pandemic, there was just four of us. Junior American Horse, Warren Hawk, Everett Iron Eyes, and myself. We went to the communities. We fed. And it was just us guys that talked with each other. How I know is my wife. She made soup, we ate soup, bread. And next couple of days we warmed it up at home. You know, we, uh, we did that to get people involved. Because in our constitution back home, they swear to uphold the Treaty of 1868. Stand there and do that. Why we were meeting was how, how can we get them to incorporate the Treaty of 1868? A lot of people say you can't. You know, well, that's a challenge. I think he can. Might be some constitutional changes, but I think he can. And that's that's the that's another challenge. Getting our council to initiate that constitutional change. So we went a step back, took a step back. Well, let's, let's study it then. Let's study how we can incorporate that treaty. We have our boundaries. We just had a big gathering up there, protecting the water. It ends up that, that 
It means it was been declared illegal. There's oil still going through that. You guys clap Biden, pat him on the back. He cut, he put an end to KXL. Could have did the same for Dakota Axis. Never did. The favorite Obama came to Standing Rock. Never did. It, it don't matter who who's in who's in office. They they treat us bad. Both both of them. They treat us bad. But this will never change. And I say that because, you know, I'm, I'm an Indian. I'm a Lakota. And I'm going to stay that way whether there's a constitution or not. And my wife, my children, same way. Nothing's going to change for us. We're still going to work. We're still going to do the things we need to do to provide for each other. I got me a gun. I can still hunt. I'm 70 years old. Going to teach my grandson this this year. I've been teaching him different things. And we were just going to go out and kill a deer. Well, we're still going to. And I'm going to show him how to fix that deer up. Stretch that hide out. So he'll know. You know, uh, when we reevaluate our con our tribal our uh, treaty of treaty groups, you know, we we've asked for money from our tribal government, free money from that has no government ties or casino money. You know. And we just put back the end of the line twice. Got put back to the end of the line. I still think that last proposal still part of the the ones that were never funded. I think there's about maybe 15, 16 projects. Ours is a three-year researcher, legal, coordinator, counsel. We need an office. A lot, of, a lot of what I'm saying came from those four people that met in getting our tribal council to realize like they do now, we might get cut funding. We might do this. We might get this. And, you know, I was fearful of what the federal government is going to do to you. They've done that to us ever since we met him. Who says you're gonna stop now? You know, we, uh, today is a, is a good day. Because, uh, you know, the, these young men are coming this way. They look at this ride as a spiritual ride. And the reason why I wanted them to hear the changes that are going to be made in this ride is because of, because of things that I heard. Going to these meetings of the artifacts and going to these meetings with concerning... Uh, what I heard about the ride at Prairie Winds Casino. What's going to happen with that? I got up and asked these guys, did they ever go up to Standing Rock and tell them? No. I said, don't you think you guys should? Uh, we uh, messaged them. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's new age protocol or what that is. 
But I always thought that our protocol was to go down face to face, look at each other. What you just wanted to happen here. And if that's what you wanted to happen, you should have had that example. We went up to Standing Rock and that's what we did. We talked to them. We visited them. We sat down. We had, you know, we still. But the riders weren't at the meetings that he came to. You talked about the artifacts, never to ride. What if they told you they didn't want them? They don't want to have them. Prayed it around with. What's going to happen then? So, that's going to happen when we get down the wounded knee, close to there. Still got to make that decision. Still got to talk to them to the face, in their face. To me, I thought that was traditional protocol. And I think it should be. I think that that's, that's what makes us stronger. Because we can talk. We can think and visit. We can't not answer the second message on that phone. Or we can't, we don't have to answer the phone at all. But if you go see them face to face, be different. You can sit down and visit with them. I know those young men. They had questions. When they get to green grass, what are you going to do about the, if they're going to have the artifacts, what about the drinking and drugging that's going to go on? Who's going to stop that? Instead, the meeting went around about no more rides. But actually, somebody should say, hey, got to go home. Tell that guy. Or like one guy told one of the young men back home, it's legal on Pine Ridge. We want to smoke, we can smoke. So who's going to stop them at this, when they get to the reservation border? When this is supposed to be a sacred ride. That's what we've been telling them, these young men. But this, this is a, a challenge. A challenge to all those that are involved with these to maintain the sacredness of it. I seen the, the days of the ride, itinerary you can call it, I guess. The 29th, from Wounded Knee, they ride to Kyle, oh, Pine Ridge. Um, the 29th is a sacred day. Over 300 people were killed. Murdered. And then they're gonna ride off to someplace else. Continue a ride. Of course, there may, maybe there should be a ride for the survivors. You know? Maybe there should be a a separate, because when did they find the survivors? Next day? No, day after, you know, two, three days later. They started to realize who survived and where they survived and where they found each other. Some people, they didn't find each other. They took off together. You know, I, I like to do research myself. I read a lot and, um, and then I, I listen to a lot of the older folks. They're gone. I'm 70 and I, you know, I, I just, and I can't find too many people older than me back home. But I, 
I, I listened to them. And I went around with people like Reginald Bird or Joe Walker. Dan Defender. Dave Spotted Horse. And we would go to meetings. By halfway to meetings, we'll, you know, get hungry. So Reginald's wife would all get the get her uh her bread out and cut her bread in half and make her sandwiches with kamal cheese and tea, coffee. Eat that. Go to meeting. After the meeting, make it home by about three, four o'clock in the morning. That was treaty meeting. We should have a treaty meeting like this every month. Maybe we'll get something done. Because we're talking the same things my uncles talked about. They were talking legislation. They were talking United Nations, World Court. And this was in the 70s, 80s. And they were getting new information as time went on. Some lawyers shoot in, stay a couple of months, get them all fired up again, and off they go. But I, if our tribal council committed to hosting a meeting, I'm gonna try to ask them to host it right away, January, soon. Hosted at Prairie Nights or Grand River. I know I had some, uh, some of my friends here that we sit on the Elders Preservation Council. I haven't seen them for a while. I was surprised to see them at this meeting. I didn't know they were interested. If they were, they should. I'm a, an approachable man. They could, could. I'm related to them. But those are things that we need to, we need to do. Because I have a phone, I don't have it on me. I leave it in the car if I have to go any place, go in, even go in cafe and eat. I leave it in the car. Come in here and leave it outside. It could ring and buzz and all that, I wouldn't know. I can contact them when I get out of here if I need to contact them, if I want to contact them. But, you know, this day is a, is a sacred day for me. Sitting Bull was killed this morning. Um, his people left in family groups throughout this day, next day, next day. Some of them came back. They all made it to the south side of the canyon of the Grand River. We have relatives still live there yet today. I want to thank Phil for not forgetting us. I want to thank uh, you people for being here, for listening. You know, there's still lots more to be said. And uh, 
I, I can't find the words to say it in a good way. So I won't say it. But there are things that we need to, we really need to do. And whether there's one, even one treaty office, if it's a treaty office, my people sign that treaty too. If there's a treaty group that's doing something, you know, my people sign that treaty too. If you're going to approach the, the government in any way using the treaty, let us know. My people sign that treaty too. I say that only because we talk of unity. And only thing place that I know is where we get unity is in that treaty. There's reasons why we're Oglala, Okwoju, Minikoju, Sichangu, Hunkpapa. There's reasons. But there's reasons why we should better communicate. <laughs> so I want to let these young men know City Bull song. I would like to hear them. If they don't, that's okay. I sang it this morning. Oh, that's you do. You guys, can you hear me? Tatsuka, you take a long way. Kita yoko. She royal, which I kill. Yeah, 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 yeah
Next one will be bringing in USDA, Damien, leader charge. After his presentation will be Indigenous Global Council, Amy Lewis, Wild Foundation. University of South Dakota, not USDA. Uh, University of South Dakota. <laughs> Daddy was talking about That's me, didn't it? Yeah. Phil's the one that led me astray and uh, set me up. All right. Oh. To talk about the commodities, huh? Omitake Tokiala Chiwopila Chichapolo, Yuha, Chante Washte Nape Chuza Papolo, uh Damon Leader Charger Machia, Suchangu, Ogalala Lakota, Hemacha. Um uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you all for the time. I uh, one time only introduced myself as an enrolled member of the Rosewood Sioux tribe until my Ina scolded me accordingly as she should, because I not only represent my my Ate's side of the family, I also represent hers. I come from the Lewis Leader Charge Tioshpe of Wososa Wakpa, a Parmley community of the Sichangu, and maternally I come from the Daniel Battle and Tioshpe of uh, Battle and Station of the Allen District of the Ogallala. I I'm the Director of Tribal Outreach for the University of South Dakota and also um, the part of the Diversity Inclusion Offices at Sanford School of Medicine. I'm an alum of the University of South Dakota. Uh, my mother had me there when she was uh, working on her undergrad, along with Tumi, Faith, and a lot of others that were over that way. My son doesn't know it. If you saw him on my screen, uh, Saver, he doesn't know it, but he's going to carry on that tradition as a third generation, uh, Shukmani to Oyate. Uh, I uh, really appreciate being at the University of South, South Dakota in terms of the great work that we're doing. and. <laughs> especially uh, the support that we're getting from the president's office, the provost's office. Um, it's, it's brought some really great people there to ensure that uh, our students there succeed. We know it's a culture shock like no other, so we're there hands-on as much as possible, which is a segue to uh, my partner here, my Kola, my Tahanshi, uh, uh, presenting me here and, and assisting us with this presentation here. I'll let him introduce himself. Wopila, hello. Hello, my relatives. My name is John Little. I'm the Director of Native Recruitment and Alumni Engagement at the University of South Dakota. I'm an enrolled member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Um, I was a product of relocation, so my uh, father... Uh, relocated to Denver. So I grew up in Denver for the first part of my life and then uh, was uh, also in Winter, South Dakota for, for the rest of it as well, too. Um, I'm also a USD alum, too. I got my master's degree uh, there. And then I also got my uh, bachelor's degree at that school up north we're not supposed to talk about, South Dakota State. Um, and then got my doctor, did my doctorate work at the University of Minnesota. 50% uh, of my role, part of my role is kind of helping students transition. So um, this year we had 57 incoming freshman students um, at USD uh, from all, all nine tribal nations, but then also including Navajo Nation and some other com tribal communities as well, too. Uh, and then the other 50% of my role is working with uh, Native alumni. We have at, at least 1,200 Native alumni, probably closer to 1,500. Uh, we're working on kind of creating a database for that right now as well, too. And so um, we're here today, I guess, representing the University, University of South Dakota, the um, 
uh, Oral History Center. And I, I don't know if you want to transition into that as well, too. I just wanted to speak a little bit more on this uh, opening slide. This uh, presentation was done at the Association of Tribal Libraries and Archives and Museums. It was my first time attending that conference. Uh, it was a really, we're one of seven repositories in the nation and, and the interviews that we house, which we'll get into a little bit later, is one of the biggest and I feel the best repositories. But this here is our project team. Um, obviously, most of them aren't here due to the weather. Uh, Dr. Elise Boxer, um, she's part of this presentation. Dr. Sam Hurley, who's the director of the oral history department. Dr. Elise Boxer is also the director of the Institute of American Indian Studies at the University of South Dakota. Um, there's me as a tribal outreach director, uh, Dr. Little. Um, and most of this presentation is propping up our grad students, uh, Toshka, Gavin Spottetail, and Toja Maya Red Horse. Or Red Horse. We were gonna attempt to zoom them in because they couldn't drive, but they're actually without lights. So I uh, even keep them, those relatives on all from our respective homelands, you know, that are struggling like that in terms of not having electricity. They really wanted to zoom in because most of this presentation is based on the work they've been doing with the interviews. Um, so I want to uh, say a little bit about Dr. Hurley. He called me late Sundays, like, I got to cancel. Do you think they'll cancel l and I? And I was like, no. Um, you cancel, l and I doesn't cancel. You, you go early or you cancel. And, and um, I forgot to uh, welcome you all in terms of happy l and I to you all. So this is our project team, our principal investigators, Dr. Uh, Dan Daly, who's of the libraries at USD, and we're funded by the Doris Duke Charitable, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation Revitalization Project. There we go. So again, the, the Oral History Center is a partnership between the University of South Dakota and the Institute of American Indian Studies. Uh, and the Institute of American Indian Studies was originally founded as the Institute of Indian Studies in 1955. Uh, it was a Board of Regents approved, um, state legislation approved uh, in, in, again in 1955. Um, and then the beginning of the Doris Duke grant and the, the American Indian Research Project actually started in 1966. So that was a project that Doris Duke actually personally funded herself. Um, I've been able to look at some of the archival records and actually see like letters back and forth. Um, and that actually came from, I think her personal like 10% savings fund. Um, and so it's so really cool to kind of see the history of that. But again, that founded in 1966 and the original project of that was called the American Indian Project Research Project. So the AARP is kind of the, the short name for that. The first director of the, the Oral History Center was actually Dr. B. Medicine. Um, and then Joseph Rockboy was really instrumental in, in helping found a lot of that too. Um, and really the, the kind of foundation of that, 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 that funding from Doris Duke, I think lasted um, about five to six years um, and really kind of built the brunt of the Oral History Center up from around 1966 to 1975. That's when they did a ton of like a brunt of these interviews um, going across, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as well, going across the state of South Dakota, but kind of the Midwest as well, interviewing um, not just native people, but um, all, all different sorts of people about their experiences. Um, as you can see, the ARP has 1,600 uh, plus recordings, um, which include more than 50 tribal nations. Uh, and again, a majority of those are coming from the Midwest as well, too. Um, there's been a lot of different contributions and accomplishments and challenges uh, that, have, that have come from this as well, too. One of the biggest things uh, that came from this project was actually to be an Indian. Uh, it was kind of a compilation um, that was, I think, published in the 1950s through the University of South Dakota, but also um, through the Oral History Center. And Basically, it took different parts of those interviews um, and it, along with photographs and, and uh, shared those stories of uh, a majority of the people from South Dakota, kind of focusing on the 1930s to the 1960s. Um, the Oral History Center and then the AARP collection is actually visited by people from across the world. Um, and so you're getting a lot of people from South Dakota coming to, to hear different stories and, and, and looking through the collections to see that. Um, but it's also, uh, again, people coming from um, all across the world to do research to kind of to do that. So it is a really vast collection that has a lot of different things in it from um, talking about agriculture to, to treaty meetings and or tr treaties and different things like that as well. Um, and it, 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 again, it's just talking a lot about native history, um, talking about tribal sovereignty and different perspectives. It includes all nine tribal nations. And as you'll see in a second, 
But again, really, they were sending out individuals to actually go collect these stories um, from a lot of different communities. And so um, I think that original grant had like $66,000 in it um, to kind of go do that. So as you can imagine, it resulted in a lot of different interviews as well, too. So as we're kind of thinking about this um, right now and reanalyzing this collection, again, this collection's been there, um, but hasn't often been, um, they, they've had to kind of recategorize it. Um, it was originally on kind of the mixed reel tapes and a lot of those have been damaged. So going through and actually like fixing it um, and then documenting and tracking what is on those things and looking through that on uh, kind of current indigenous theories and methodologies. And so one of the big things that Dr. Boxer's really been training uh, Gavin and Maya, the two graduate students on, is kind of thinking a little bit about decolonization um, and using Wazi uh, a lot of her theories from one of her books, but also thinking about these and, and challenging notions of intellectual property, but also thinking about sovereignty and like who owns these. So originally um, when these were, were published, like they belonged to the University of South Dakota, but also thinking about um, these as kind of more of a, a collection um, owned by people who are uh, producing the histories, but also like collecting the histories as well. I'm thinking a little bit about those too. Here's a breakdown, and this is an updated breakdown that we got in terms of the Ocheti Shakoi within South Dakota that are represented in those interviews. Uh, we'll touch a little bit more on terms of how that was increased in certain areas due to Maya and Gavin's work with the interviews. Um, but one thing that I'd really like to uh, uh, emphasize is we know that, and I like to cite Lexi Bill Means on, um, I've heard this really young in my life when um, being around him, he's a mentor, a father figure to me that uh, South Dakota, and we all know it, South Dakota is still a Cowboys versus Indian state, last of the frontier, but there are beams of hope um, I really see that the Institute of, Institute of American Indian Studies is one of them, where legislators back in the 50s were talking about, we need to do something for the tribal students that are coming to the University of South Dakota. So if we're not the very first Institute of American Indian Studies in the nation, we're one of the very first. And I think that really has to be mentioned. Um, it was just uh, revitalized two years ago uh, through my position, through Dr. Boxer's position. Um, which, again, says a lot about our president and, and our provost's leadership. Also, I relate that to the late Governor Milkelson's year of reconciliation in terms of changing Columbus Day into Native American Day. You see that in the past five years, it's been very trendy throughout the nation, but it's been, what, 31 years since we did that. So there are, you know, those, those rays of hope in terms of what we have going on in South Dakota. And, um, yeah, I... So this part of my position as a director of tribal outreach and being part of this project team is doing outreach. And I'd love to jump in my car and go to every tribe. That's a lot easier said than done. So we've been partnering with uh, Tui I, I own through the Tipo office there at the Rosebud Sioux tribe. She set a date for us to come visit. We did our best to uh, roll out the USD red carpet. She wasn't able to come, but the past president, Rodney Bordeaux was able to come and uh, Lexi Philem and Twigo. Um, we did our best again um, to feed them according to culture protocol. And um, I think Lexi Phil said that he was full the whole time because of uh, how many meals we had. But um, this was very historic for us, especially for those, those non-native staff and faculty to have the tribe there, which brought us here. Um, I feel that the outreach for what we have at USD in terms of our interviews would be a lot better handled here rather than me traveling to every tribe. So I'd really like to cite Rodney Bordeaux and Philemon in terms of what they were able to gain through Maya and Gavin working with the interviews the past year and a half or so. We'd love to work with the interviews, but we're so busy at USD we don't get to. So I think each of them had about a list of 10 interviews that they wanted shared with them. And there's a number of ways we can share them with you. We can rip them to a CD, we can burn them to a CD, we can drop them in a Dropbox and email them to you. Our, our, what we're really trying to do is get guiding principles from the TIPO directors on how we want to share these online through a Mercadu, a website called Mercadu. Mercadu is a Maori word for sharing or like a bag, sharing a bag of stuff um, really generically. But after they got, or pre-getting these, coming to USD, then after Rodney has been, continually saying that we have gold there at USD. 
amongst these interviews that we sh that I showed you earlier, you very well could have an, a relative that has knowledge stored there at USD through the interviews. So if you would like to us to run a query, please reach out. We can do that through our director, Sam Hurley. Yeah, and so just so you can kind of see, this is, again, this is normally something that, that Gavin and Meyer are talking a little bit about, but this has kind of been their process for, for going through all these interviews. So um, there are over 2,400 interviews at the thing. Not, of all, not all of them are that American Indian Research Project, but um, they've continued uh, collecting interviews um, beyond that project since that Doris Duke funding originally, or the original funding ran out. Um, so they've gone through basically 2,400 uh, interviews um, which comprise 55 box boxes, and then they're cross-referencing a lot of those documents, um, basically to obtain as much information as possible, seeing if they could find, you know, living relatives or any, or different things like that. Um, listening to the audio to see the quality. Uh, I think we have a slide on that next, but um, the quality is very. Uh, it ranges. There's a there's a big range of like how 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 good the quality is. You could have the best headphones in the world, and sometimes you're just not going to be able to to get that quality uh, worked out to be able to listen to it. Um, but then ag again, they're going through all these and then they're placing it in a spreadsheet for organization. So that's how we're able to kind of track all of those and see tribal specific. So originally when these were collected, a lot of times they were just putting like Sioux or different words like that that were kind of, um, and so trying to go through and look through tribal specifics and, and again, finding as much information as possible, putting in descriptions, keywords, um, talking about if their knowledge is or songs or, or, or whatever. And, just wanting to make sure we're kind of categorizing that, but then also analyzing it and making sure that we're not putting it out there. If it's something that, that should not be out to the public, making sure that we're making notes of that as well too. Um, and then using those spreadsheets to eventually upload those to Mukadu, uh, which is uh, eventually the goal is to kind of make that accessible. Um, but again, making sure that we're cross-checking to making sure that we're putting things that, that should or should not be accessible um, and, and checking on those as well too. And then um, again, returning and meeting with tribal uh, tribal nations and families. So I've actually we've had students come this year that you know you hear their last name and it's like oh you know you have a we have a, a freshman actually her uh, grandfather had an interview in the oral history center talking about his Vietnam experiences and so I told her about that and she she had no idea so she's able to actually listen to to that that interview and listen to his his voice and so. Um, we've been able to do that quite a few times. Um, we're all connected, as, as everyone knows. And so it's kind of cool when you can kind of connect some of those stories, especially if it's a relative that they've never met or never heard. Um, and so really kind of bringing those together to do a little bit of, of that as well, too. Do you have anything to add on that? Okay. So we can probably skip this part. This is mostly just talking about the audio quality. The, the audio quality varies, um, and that, that is one of the big challenges, some of them. Um, you know, there's parts of it that are good, some of it it's not. And so that's just one of the challenges we've faced. Do you want to talk a little bit about Rosebud quick? Again, I can't say enough about Maya and Gavin's work with these interviews. We talk about wanting to do this work with the interviews, but we don't have the time. But the fact that we have JDs, PhDs, and MDs now makes our work that much more critical. Um, you see, and during this, in this pilot project with the Rosebud Sioux Tribe interviews, our interviews went from 162 to 347, with all due respect, or not. That's because th those are non-native researchers that are working with these interviews and they don't know, maybe they're talking about Cheyenne River, so they're thinking that interview is a Cheyenne River interview. So these students able to distinguish that, no, it's not a Cheyenne River interview, it's a Sichongo interview. So again, this work is that much critical. I hope we did Maya and Gavin some justice because I saw them give this presentation and they were very good. They knocked it out at a ballpark out in California during, California during the ATOM conference. But we have to wrap up soon. Wopila, there's our, our information there. Um, if you wanted us to run that query or if you want to pull us aside, I don't think we have time for questions, but we're here for a little while longer. We are hosting a USD alumni event over in the ice arena at five. If you'd like to come, you're more than welcome. Crash it, please. And then we have an educators a luncheon, counselors a luncheon tomorrow in the same place in the ice arena at 11.30. Okay, whoopi la, hello. They were fast. <laughs> That's what academic training does. Makes you get to speak for hours and not even blink an eye. Oh, hi. We'll call each other. She'll sing a song and then we're going to take a 10 minute break.
We'll be uh, coming back with uh, Amy Lewis and then uh, Ion Quigley and then Joe. You can get my number from the two double Okay, 10 minute break. Quick announcement here. Yesterday, we were to uh, have a documentary premiere of the Oyate, the documentary. We're going to show that tonight. If those of you who are available uh, wants to uh, see the doc documentary Oyate, uh, the, and the fifth member says that I can use the equipment. <laughs> the fifth member um, uh, guarantees it. We'll have uh, popcorn and soda here. Uh, you, you can see the fifth member for any overtime fees. Another announcement, uh, even the uh, the conference will come to an end, but the work doesn't end. So, And I hope that we can uh, continue meeting in a, a couple more months somewhere. I encourage the fifth member to host a meeting in Oglala. I, I encourage Cedric to set up a meeting in uh, Hunkpapa, and to Manny and Harry to set up a meeting in uh, Cheyenne River. Phil, how long is that movie? Um, hour and a half. All right. Ah, shit, okay. Uh, Takun, I optel, I pray, chilo. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to switch to English here. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, if you have uh, student athletes playing over there, you should go over there and watch them play because whether you know it or not, that uh, makes a big impact for them. 
that we should try to support our uh, children and grandchildren that way. So I just wanted to, uh, on Wakapash Day, I just wanted to pay a, a, a tribute and honor um, one of the uh, people who started everything on Wakapash Day as far as the basketball was concerned. And his name was Freddie Knife. Maybe some of you remembered him. But uh, uh, he, he's the one that set that bar pretty high for us at uh, on Wakapawash Day. So some of us, uh, we uh, tried to uh, be on the same bar with him, with whatever he set. But Freddie, uh, I knew him.
Council, and it'll be Amy Lewis from Wild Foundation. And then from there, it'll be Joe. What's I did say Lewis. Oh. <laughs> That's what's them getting. Uh, could you bring his hearing aid back up here? <laughs> no, I don't. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> uh, thank you, everybody, for um, being here and for allowing me to address you. I also wanted to thank uh, Phil Two Eagle for inviting me here. Um, I'm still learning what it means to be an, an ally and an advocate uh, of the Ocheti Shakoin, so I welcome um, any feedback or correction after this. I like stories, so I'm going to start with a story before getting into the meat of this presentation. And I want to start with the story of the origins of my organization, the Wild Foundation. We're a wilderness conservation group. Um, we work in a slightly different way than other wilderness conservation groups because we work by building communities and leadership around the protection and conservation of um, our wild and beautiful planet. And the way we started was actually in South Africa in the 1960s. Now, um, any of you who know the history of South Africa know that this was a time of brutal racism. It was basically illegal for white men and black men to associate with one another. And it was during this time that a partnership and friendship was formed between the two founders of my organization, Ian Player, a white South African game ranger, and, he, and a Zulu elder, Makubu Ntambala. And Ian was as racist as, as every other white South African male at the time. Um, but the journey to him beginning to overcome that racism is the story that I'm going to tell, and it's the origins of, of, of Wild. One day, Ian and Makubu were out in the Umfalozi Game Reserve. Now, the Umfalozi is the oldest protected area in Africa. Uh, it's the oldest protected area by the white colonizers of Africa, but even before the white man cult uh, colonized Africa, um, the Zulus were protecting it. Kachaweo, the king of the Zulus, had set this area aside. And um, the Zulu kings were allowed to hunt in it once a year, but for the rest of the year, it was left for nature. And um, Ian and, and Makubu are out in the middle of this wilderness, hours away from civilization, in the month of the tall grasses, when the grasses came up to their hips or higher. And they're forging through this grass, and they come upon a stone mound of all sorts of little stones that have been piled up over the years. And Makubu bends down and picks up a stone and puts it on this pile. It's called an isivavain. He puts it on this pile, and he asks Ian to do the same. And Ian says, no, I have no part in your, your primitive superstitions. I will not put a stone on the pile. And Ian continues to walk through the grass. But Makubu won't move. He stays there. And he says, I will not join you until you respect the land and put a stone on the pile. This, stone, this, this pile of stones marks something. Something happened here. Someone died here. A battle occurred here. Uh, a manifestation happened. And if you don't put a stone, you're not acknowledging the land and what happened here. Well, Ian would have nothing of it. And he kept walking and it was hot and the flies were buzzing around him. And he looked back and there, back by the stone pile, Makubu was waiting and he would not move. Finally, Ian sighed in frustration. He walked back to Makubu. He picked up a stone, he put it on the pile. And he said, there, are you happy? And Makubu nodded and they continued to walk through the grass. About 300 yards later, a black mamba, one of the most poisonous and aggressive snakes there, there, there are, rises out of the tall grass directly in front of Ian and Makubu and gazes directly into their eyes. I bet it was the longest moment of both of their lives because in, 
in a blink of the eye, that snake could have bitten both of them and they would have been dead within 15 minutes. But instead, the snake kind of hovered there for a moment and then it sank back into the grass and slithered away. Ian and Makubu took a deep breath and walked away and then Makubu gave Ian the lecture of his life and said, if you had not put that stone on the pile, that would have gone a completely different way because the land is more than just the physical and biological relations on it right now. The land is everything that has ever happened on it. It is everything that ever will happen on it. And when you take a moment to acknowledge it, you acknowledge the land and you become a part of those relationships in a conscious way. And that's when Wild was born. And that's when Makubu became the master and Ian became the student. I share this story with you now because it relates to what I'm going to talk about today, but it also relates to a question that I think is on everybody's minds in, in this room, at least at an unconscious level, but maybe in a very conscious level. And this question was actually posed to me a few nights ago by Dr. Joseph Robertson back there with the maps, because he, he asked me, Amy, what does decolonization look like? What does decolonization look like? Not in 1491, but in 2023. It's not my place to answer that question. I'm just a washichu. But um, if there's, I would certainly, if any of you want to talk about it, I would certainly love to hear what your visions are of decolonization. And from my washichu point of view, the the story that took place between Ian and Makubu was one small microscopic instance of decolonization. It was decolonization of a relationship between a man, not fully, but between two men. And the implications for what that means and, and the work that Wild Foundation is doing is essentially what I'm here to talk about today. The title of my presentation is The Not-So-Sexy Indigenous Global Council. But what does that mean? And why am I here talking about it? The fact is, although I care deeply about the Lakota and other indigenous groups, I didn't set out on this journey with the intention of being any type of savior for the Lakota or helping them. I believe that you are an incredibly resilient people and you have the leadership that you need within your community to solve prob the problems that you face, even though they are some of the most challenging problems in the world. I set out on a journey to protect half of Earth's land and seas because scientifically, that's what, what the scientists say is needed in order to keep the the life-giving services that our planet provides to us, our civilizations and our communities, to keep them functioning. Once we cross that half threshold, we enter precarious and dangerous terrain. It's a lot. It's a lot of land. It's a lot of seas. And people in, in, from, from my culture can't imagine what it means to protect that much. given that my culture is the one that put us in this position as it is, <laughs> it's not surprising that we can't imagine how to protect that much. I mean, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that got you into that problem, right? But it occurred to me that there are people who do know how to protect that much. Earlier today, I was talking to Milo for breakfast, like over breakfast. It was, I, I usually have breakfast with Delano and he's great, but um, I, I had the privilege of, of having a couple of words with Milo. And I was telling him about my partner who's half Mapuche, but because of the colonization of South America has really been disconnected from his culture. And my partner and I have had these discussions about the Mapuche people, and my partner has expressed frustration and disappointment 
with his cultural background because he said, you know, what, what did we leave behind? We didn't leave behind roads. We didn't leave behind fortresses. We didn't leave behind amazing engineering or architecture. And I was telling this to Milo, and Milo said, they left behind a healthy and intact ecosystem. That was their monument. Nature was their monument. The healthy relationship was, with the land was their monument. And that's more than enough. So Milo was stating things that much more articulately than I have thought about them. But he was basically stating things I've been thinking about for the last couple of years. Because the fact of the matter is, indigenous peoples around the world are the best stewards of biodiversity and nature. Even though they make up less than 5% of the world's population and have disproportionately low amount of resources because of colonization, they steward 80% of the remaining biodiversity on this planet. They steward nearly 40% of the remaining wildlands on this planet. And they do so, how? In my culture, we're always asking for more science. We're always asking for more resources. We need this much money to protect this small parcel of land. We need this much science um, in order to do this. And yet, here are indigenous peoples who've, you know, many of them are in very remote areas where maybe not even a single member of their tribe has even finished um, secondary school, let alone college. And somehow, they are doing things that the best educated scientists and the best funded land management agencies on the planet cannot do. How are they doing that? My hypothesis is that indigenous people know something and practice something that my culture has lost or never had. And that is what I call cultural-based approaches to conservation through values, attitudes, institutions, and ceremony, indigenous peoples are able to put to practice the knowledge that they gather and observe, and the knowledge that scientists from my culture will come in after them and either acquire from them or observe on a secondary level, but my culture is never able to put that knowledge to practice, but somehow, Culturally, indigenous peoples are able to do that. I'm just back from the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, where, and you know, you've heard, of, you've heard about COP27 and the climate convention that happened in Egypt. Um, the Convention on Biological Diversity is the, the lesser known sibling of the climate um, um, convention, and it's basically where the United Nations gathers to collectively answer what we're going to do about the biodiversity crisis. In my opinion, the convention is misnamed. Biodiversity is a deceptively sterile term, because what biodiversity is, is life. It is all of the species and, the, and the, the relationships. It's the sum of all species and the relationships between those species that produces the conditions that makes this planet livable. So what the United Nations is actually doing right now up in Montreal is they're having the convention on life and the protection of life. And they're doing so with a bunch of nation states as the decision makers. Indigenous peoples do not have standing in the Convention on Biological Diversity because they do not fit the, category, the, the, the definition of a, na a nation state. So I've just come back from that, and there's an argument ongoing at this convention. Now, at this convention, they're not even talking about protecting half. That's what scientists want to do. That's what they recommend. But they, this convention has basically banned the word half and 50% from all negotiations. The highest ambition, uh, ambitious target is 30%. And let me tell you about 30%. We're already at 30%. Because if you combine the percentage of terrestrial 
areas that are protected in, in national parks and nature reserves and things like that, we're at 17%. And if you combine that with the, the, the percentage of indigenous lands that's high quality and ecologically intact, that's also 17%, which means we're currently at 34%. And 34% is not enough. We have a mass extinction crisis. We have the climate crisis. Mother Earth has a fever. But that's where we're at. We're at 34% right now. So the most ambitious target would actually put us back 4%. And at this convention, there's a false dichotomy that is playing out in the negotiations. Some of the worst actors, the states who want to mine and log and exploit the most, are saying, oh, we can't have higher targets because that would violate the rights of indigenous peoples. Some of the worst actors are using the rights of indigenous peoples as an excuse not to protect the planet. My organization and the coalition that we formed are saying, actually, you can do both. And in fact, you can practice restorative justice by committing to the other. Because what we're advocating for is the protection and conservation of 50% of Earth's surface by expanding and strengthening indigenous land tenure. In fact, we'd like to see the amount of indigenous lands doubled. Because if you take 17% of the lands that indigenous people now have, have, um, have official jurisdiction over, and you give them back some of the lands that they have claims to, and you double that to 17%, that puts us at 51% globally. That puts us at over half. The question is, is the world willing to relinquish control of the lands to the best biodiversity stewards that there are? Of course, this message is being silenced, and um, we're working like hell to get it out there, um, but it's hard to do. And that's why I've come to the Lakota people and the Ocheti Shakoin and Phil Two Eagle to ask for their help in forming an alliance around this issue. I think that all of us care deeply about the protection of nature, perhaps for slightly different reasons, but they overlap. And I think that everyone in this room and certainly everyone in my organizations cares deeply about restoring justice to the Ocheti Shakoin and to other indigenous groups. And so that's why I would like to work together to protect half of Earth's land and seas and restore and expand indigenous land tenure. One of the avenues that I would like to pursue in order to do this is the establishment of an indigenous um, people's global governance council over the protection of Earth's biosphere. This council would be made up of representatives from tribes across North America and the rest of the world and would meet annually to discuss um, the challenges ahead in that year and to also make recommendations. The council would be served by a group of non-voting trustees from mainstream culture, uh, B Corp representatives, representatives from the media, representatives from Google Maps, who would advise at the council's discretion, but who would also publish and disseminate the council's recommendations, ensuring that the advice, wisdom, and knowledge of indigenous leaders made it out to a broader audience about what is needed. Because here's the thing, for decades, maybe a little over a century, my culture and conservation scientists in my culture have taken it upon themselves to go into the wilder places of this planet and to instruct this, the planet's best stewards of biodiversity on how they could do it better. That's colonization. But an act of decolonization would to be invite 
the planet's best biodiversity stewards into the not wild half, into the urban and agricultural half, and ask indigenous leaders for their advice on how we could repair our relationship with nature, on how we could treat nature better in the less wild, more urban, more developed areas of our planet. The time for diversity and inclusion, well, I mean, there needs to be much more diversity and inclusion, but I also feel like the time for diversity and inclusion has passed. We need more than that. There doesn't need to be a seat or two or three at the table for indigenous peoples. The table needs to be occupied primarily by indigenous peoples. They need to start helping to set the priorities and to provide the guidance that other cultures should follow. There's not a lot of time left. I want to um, give space for other speakers. So that's why I didn't bring my PowerPoint on my maps and things like that. Um, and I want to leave some time for questions if you have any. Um, so I'll conclude there. And um, thank you again for the invitation to be here. There's a hand in the back. Yes, sir, within the blue shirt. Yes, uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> I just came from Montreal too, and um, there's a bit of a problem at the conference. A few years ago, there was a movement called Local Communities, and they're really trying to overshadow uh, the indigenous peoples. And uh, it's a very scary situation because a lot of the people that I saw in the room uh, were probably pawns of uh, various governments or extractive industries that really want to take away from what you, exactly what you're talking about. So we need to have a strategy on that because uh, some of us here, like Bill and others, we spent uh, 30 years on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. There is not a declaration on the rights of local communities. And uh, so they're really trying to muddy the, the water. And in your um, request here, uh, maybe you can think about that part too, because it, it, it was, I'm, I'm following it on, on my cell phone. They're still creating problems. And the 19th is the last day. So uh, just uh, something to keep in mind. Um, thank you for that comment. And I'm not unaware of um, the challenges there. The, the term that everybody throws around at this conventions is um, IPLCs, Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities, totally conflating the two groups. You're not alone in your reservations about that. I too think that it's, it's different. Um, first off, indigenous peoples have a different relationship with the land that's based um, in ceremony. And uh, I will be right, I'll be working with our coalition and also doing what I can to start um, supporting research and immediate attention about the role that ceremony and culture actually play in empowering a culture with the political and social will, it needs to act with respect towards the natural world. But you're not alone. Um, actually, it, it was, I was in, um, I'm a member of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And while most of the members of the IUCN throw around the IPLC term all the time, there's a, a gentleman who's the deputy director of the Sus Sustainable Use and Livelihoods um, specialist group who brought that to the attention at an IUCN briefing meeting during the COP, he said, I object to the use of the term IPLCs. We need to start working to, it, it's IPs and LCs, and they're different, and we need to start treating that differently um, and um, respecting um, indigenous peoples um, in a, a distinct way that's relevant to their cultural traditions. 
I got a uh, comment and what you presented, but uh, right now there's a kind of a movement for the farmers because uh, it's called regenerative soil. There's a guy with the NRCS that uh, over 30 years retired, but he was trying to educate the white farmer into the life of the root. A lot of these indigenous plants here in South Dakota have long roots that contain the water. But with this farming and spraying, they created dirt. So the soil, this, this life, uh, regenerative, there's farmers in Iowa now that are practicing regenerative soil. It's, it's density and biodiversity. One acre of land has had 130, 140 plant species on it here. And with this livestock and this current not Lakota way of uh, raising livestock and farming has, has created maybe 30, 40 plants on that same acre now. So to go back to the density and the, the diversity of those plants on a square acre, uh, there's, in this IRA constitution, it has agronomy, soil science. So we come up with the draft ordinance under the treaty, Article 8, when 100 Lakotas get together to commence farming, we're supposed to be getting help. And this regenerative soil part of this it's critical now, and that document sitting with the IRA government over there, hopefully this next new reps will actually read it and let's do something about it and let's exercise our treaty right to farm and reintroduce the buffalo into these areas because now the buffalo is a key species, the berry bird and the prairie dog, they're key species here. They have to be reintroduced to the land and this concept Right now, the, the livestock industry is, is, is uh, going under very hard for uh, 100 head, 200 head, 300 head uh, livestock producers to stay in business. You got to be 1,000, 2,000 heads, you know, like a cooperative, which it says in these IRA governments, cooperatives have first preference to grazing permits. So there's things in these... I read the Constitution that could create a lot of jobs for our people. And there's Article 8 in the treaty that we need to start exercising, like Mr. Goodhouse says, Senator Goodhouse. I'm given the, 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 the law here with IRA and the treaty that we need to work together to make this happen. Regenerative soil, it's called. And it's actually working. I mean, it's, it's, it's creating a healthier animal. That's in, you, you keep that livestock in there, but the wildlife and the medicine and the wildlife, everything's, everything's a benefit. I don't know if they're talking about regenerative soil at the United Nations, but this guy had a hard time to convince white farmers because they were all under Monsanto. Yep. They're all under like that Shiva, Ms. Shiva from India that's filing lawsuits against them to protect indigenous like corn and you know indigenous uh, plants, indigenous vegetables, to protect them. So right now we have a chance to to do this. We have all the rights in the world to do this, but it's up to educate the elected officials and these tribal governments, and to have treaty councils push Article Eight, and to set aside lands, and to keep data on these lands to see how this regenerative soil, the guy used Metaku Uyasi, this Ray Archeda from NRCS. He said, this, this native tribe, they have a, that were related to everything. He has that in his presentation, Metaku Uyasi. So it makes that more, more uh, like the grandfather, the buffalo, the eagle, and sink petro those things that when we look to the directions, all of these things grow and get and grow. And, and that knowledge needs to come out because that plant is in there. We have to uh, uh, be real stewards of the land 
And now is a chance to do that under this agronomy, under this regenerative soil, under Article 8. I wanted to share that with Mr. Goodhouse, but he wasn't here, so we, that's, he wanted to do something with the treaty, so let's do it. Let's farm some hemp and farm some buffaloes, and, and we'll have what they call food sovereignty. There'll be no more hunger on the reservation, which bothers me very much that there's children hungry, there's families that are hungry. It bothers me when we can be doing something like this that will feed everybody and, and, and it'll benefit everybody. So it's out there, it's, it's proven itself. So I, I just wanted to share that with you, but I Thank wanted you. to share it with my brothers and sisters here too. Okay, is there, and, you, and your question was? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions? If not, I, I'll, uh, I have a little interjection here. Uh, oh. At the Ocheti uh, Shakoi, I would recommend that um, we pursue this because. Uh, Climate change is a global thing. Uh, we, we can do our part, but we can't stop climate change. But I think we could plan and prepare, but also affect change. Um, the uh, uh, Washichu uh, society is going to look towards us to, to look at not just us, but other indigenous people on how we um, care for land. Um, the European concept of uh, realty was not ours. All these lines that you, you've seen that were drawn on the maps, all the ownership lines, those are all European concept. Uh, our, our concept was we, we are part of the land. Therefore, we must uh, probably be part of the you know, solution for this uh, giant problem. Uh, we're already being affected back home um, we saw a lot of lot of fires in the last two three uh, months. Uh, all the creeks and uh, rivers dried up. Uh, I'm myself, I'm worried for the animals, our four leggeds, uh, if they have enough food and water. I, uh, ironically, the the creek that runs runs by um, uh, Wososowakpa um, uh, Cutme Creek started running again for some reason. Then other rivers went down, like the White River, and uh, in the news you'll see that the Mississippi River was running dry. Uh, a lot of things happening, so I'm very interested in uh, pursuing this approach. The uh, Ocheche Shakoni is in a good position right now to move forward on such a uh, strategy. Mitake Oh. I I think if we could have your contact information too, please. We don't we don't see it in the. Yeah, um, my apologies. So my email is very easy. It's just Amy A M Y at wild dot o r g and um, Amy at wild dot o r g, and I'd be happy um, to answer I, any of your questions. Uh, to be honest, I'm uh, I'm awful at email, but I am going to make it a priority for the Ocheti Shakuin. Um, also, just just really quickly, there's um, there's there's this is um, a long term project that uh, alliance that I would like to form, and so I I want to follow whatever protocols are needed in order to build the relationship between WILD and the Ocheti Shakoin. And um, I know that I talked about a global council and the biosphere, but um, I also believe that if Phil and the Ocheti Shakoin think it's appropriate, I can bring lots of attention and lots of resources um, to this area and um, to the, the cultural challenges and the political challenges that you face. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about that more um, with you all in the future. If I can get together with you before too long, I think there's two of us in here that should truly traditionally represent 
Itiyoshpaye. Itiyoshpaye is the foundation of traditional government. You have seven council fires of the Sioux Nation, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota. Then you have seven campfires, which people loosely refer to as Ocheti Shakoni, and who represents them. Well, I'm one of them, and I can speak for my uh, Teoshpaye. I'm very interested and concerned in this, and in my, um, my job, I'm here in a domestic capacity, so with all due apologies. But I do believe in what you're saying, and I've been to gatherings with representatives from Bolivia, Ecuador, Chile, Guatemala, and we have talked about a lot of these topics that are very critical. And I brought back the message to the Cheta um, Ilekiapi, seven council fires meeting before, and they were really up on doing things like this. So I'll get together with you and we can speak about that. And we talk about stewardship of biodiversity. It comes from who we are as a people, as a traditional people, and who truly represents traditional concepts, teachings of it. Well, I'm one of them. I have some limited knowledge of it, and I can present that to you, but I'll come and see you before you leave here, and we'll have a brief visit if you have a little time. I do, and it would be my honor. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not a good public speaker, and I'm very bashful, so it took a lot of courage <laughs> to talk. Thank you. Thank, then thank you so much. <clears throat> Wopila? Wopila? Thank you very much, everybody. Give her a hand up. It must be getting close to closing time. Everybody's kind of really telling the good ones. Um, I know we are going to go with Joe, and then we'll go with Ion. Is that Ion, Ion here? Oh. Ion first. Oh, okay. Hold on, Joe. We're going to go with Ion. 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 Okay. Ion. Ion quickly. It is your turn. Chicago THPO for a report on what the THPOs are working on. I knew I seen you really looking for something. Yep, that's her. There you go. Mm, I own the much. Ah. Uh, well, I have. Homita Kiapi, Toke Lachi, Chamastia Napi, or choose Papik store. I own Quigley and Machapi, Washitia. Now, La Colia, a hacker get going, Hemia. Si chalko mata ha na ha na ku oglala e mata ha. I carry both with pride. Wopila. Ah, tala ha e omniche unhappy. Yuka heta taku sutaya taku washteste etan hiu. Ta hena hok iwo agla king ta yuka emi chik tu zapie le. What <laughs> Oma Ocheti Shakoni et a hippie. Yunka Toke Lachi, we had a discussion on Wind Cave. Wind Cave is the place of birth for us. Hena Otrona head et a hippie store. We came from there. That is our, our birthplace. So, what is going on there? And that is a National Park Service, by the way. And what is going on there is that uh, NPS had bought a ranch there that is, uh, that is a part of the, the Wind Cave 
NPS. And so with that, we were called to a meeting on October 17th, and there was THPOs, Tribal Historic Preservation Officers from different tribes. I believe there was five different tribes that were included. And from there, we decided that there, there are several things that we want to do before anything else is done, before it is turned into a visitor center or before we have any, any kind of uh, activities there. We want to conduct a, a cultural resource survey with all the tribes included. And although there was in fact, an archaeological survey with the FONSI, the finding of no, uh, no, spe uh, no significant impacts that was done. That FONSI was a draft. And so we're going to overlook that and actually do a complete cultural resource, uh, resource survey. And then we decided in our discussions that we are going to spend some time there and kind of get a reconnection to to our relatives that were there at one time. So we did have uh, Lee Welling, who was the superintendent of uh, the national parks there at Wind Cave. And she is just so, so helpful, so willing to work with us. She's listening, she's trying to get direction from us, which is the right thing to do. Because as tribal historic preservation, goes, we are a regulatory office. Every tipple is a regulatory office. There are rule uh, mandates that we go by, kind of looking at working within the NEPA, NAICPRA, ARPA, the American Indian Freedom of Religion Act, and the National Museum Act. So within those, every shovel of dirt that comes up cannot happen unless we follow the NHPA, the Section 106, which allows consultation with tribes. And following that process, she did consult with the tribes, and that is uh, what came out of that. So we are working within the treaty lands and the Aboriginal lands as well, the ancestral and or Aboriginal lands. So with this being said, I think our next step is to actually get the tribes together, get the affiliated tribes and make a visit there. Not just one day, but a couple of days actually should be done. So in our meeting as well, we did, we did find and discuss that we need to work in unity. Yuptayala. Remember that word because it means together as one. Yuptayala. And that is where we have to go as THPOs, and we recognize that. So we were thankful that we had that discussion, that we did have that little caucus to ourselves. And as I understand, it was the, the time for the Sichango people to host a meeting, which we did yesterday. Um, we, were, we were a little bit disappointed that not everybody showed up. Well, we did try to apply it as you will and live stream it, but it just was uh, too late in the process. And it was meant to be. Things that happen are always meant to be. The Lakota people, we don't believe in coincidences. When something happens, it is meant to happen. It is destiny. So then we went on into discussion of the Wakbashita, the cultural center in Pier. It is a building, it is, it is vacant, and we do need 
to have a central place for the northern tribes, for the Great Plains tribes, if you will, to have a central place for the data, for information, for artifacts. Yeah, so we did make some plans and we will be approaching the other tribes as well. And we plan to actually approach uh, Peak Coffee from the, uh, from the three affiliated tribes to actually fund as he uh, once said he would. So uh, I'm sure he will honor his word. So with that, um, we're kind of looking at the feasibility of what could happen there. And we're looking at the feasibility of creating a center for just that, for data, for artifacts to be stored there, for historical information, and a whole bit. So kind of look forward to, I, I really do look forward to seeing that happen as well. And then we went on into the, the discussion of NEPA and NEGPRA. But I will touch on the NEPA first. As, as we go, um, a lot of what had happened in the Black Hills, for instance, the uranium mining, those, those activities, those developments happened before NEPA was enacted. So the difficult thing about that is that we are standing here looking back at those uranium mines that had been opened before NEPA was enacted and the cleanup of those such places. For instance, and I use this example uh, because it, it really uh, touches my heart that the flora, the fauna, the water, the soils were all studied, yes, Yes, they were, by the scientific value of looking at those things. And I say things because that is what science really does. It objectifies flora, fauna, water, air. The world of science objectifies life because they are a part of life. And one of, the, um, one of the points that I saw in, that re in a report that was done by the uh, Harding County archeologist, the Black Hills uh, National Forest was that they, uh, they came upon a plant and they said, oh, well, this plant happens to uh, detoxify And we know as natives that yes, those plants, those relatives do exist. And so they saw only a minute, pers uh, uh, minute par a portion of that. They said this plant seems to de detoxify, but that was all in that report. And in addition to that, if you look at the, the Lakota perspective, the native perspective of, those, of that particular plant, yes, it will detoxify. But the most important part of it was lacking and that is that you have to make prayer. You have to make connection. You have to request just as you would a person, a two-legged that you honor and respect. That is the approach that we take with a plant when we ask for something, in that case, to detoxify. So the water levels there seems to be okay. And when I mentioned that, okay, so this plant has the ability to detoxify, why are you not using it? Why are you not applying that knowledge? But the native perspective to that is that we approach that plant with respect. 
and honor. And I, I truly believe personally that, um, that if, if that was done, what's respect and honor, that it could well be that that plant is the one that would clean up the toxins in that area. So we're looking at, at science and we're looking at in, indigenous science. And I think the integration of both would probably be necessary for survival, for the climate change that my cousin was talking about, and for other things as well, to live a healthier life. Well, the, the National Environmental Protection Act, it is a good thing. It was written with good intentions, but it is not applied. And I will give you a good example of that as well. The Crow Butte renewal of uranium mining, we highly, highly, as TIPOs, we, we advocate, we advocated for that license to not be renewed. But they went ahead and did it. So have we become, as TIPOs, a checkbox? Have we become that checkbox so that they can say, oh, we consulted with that tribe and that tribe, so, and having a Zoom meeting and saying, yeah, we consulted. There has to be a solid understanding that we as Native people have good knowledge, good information about the flora and the fauna, the water, the air. So I think that uh, in that case, the world of science needs to partially, uh, and I'm saying partially because I don't see any time where the scientists are gonna actually admit that our world of science is just as significant. So that is the, the discussions we had on the NEPA, and now I get into the NAGPRA, and that discussion uh, took quite, uh, quite a while, a good part of the day. And I will tell you from personal experience that there was a case that our tribe had to bring home relatives from, from Carlisle. And I think the work had been started before I got in as tipple, and there was uh, good research being done. However, the research came to a stop came to a little block, if you will. And when I looked into it, I realized that that little block, that little challenge that we had, where the research seemed to not go further than a certain place, it is because our records as indigenous people, our records were under the War Department. They were under the Department of War at one time. And that was before the BIA was established. And then the records started going to the BIA. But the BIA, in turn, they sent the records down to uh, Kansas City, to the uh, repository there. And it was so hard to get records from that place. It's easier now, it is easier now. And I don't want to discourage anybody, but I, I needed to share that, that that's where we had a, the biggest challenge. And when I had a few minutes with Secretary Holland, I was able to actually tell her that that, that was our biggest challenge right there, was getting records from the BIA and then getting records from 
canvas itself. <clears throat> and I believe things have gotten easier since then. And I saw for myself that our relatives in Carlisle were actually moved. They are telling me one time they got moved from one cemetery to the present one. I am saying they got moved twice. And the evidence to that is that we found an animal bone, a cow bone, if you will, in one of the one of the uh, disinterments. And that was unsettling, to say the least, to see that one of our relatives was actually buried with the cow bone. So I started asking, is this a NAGPRA case? And I was told that no, it is not a NAGPRA case. Yet, it was on a federal register, federal lands, and federal funding. So that tells me that it was indeed a, a NAGPRA case. So I will read to you some of the things that we discussed and some of the things that we want to see changed. Now, I want to tell the other TIPOs and the treaty officers that we have a deadline of January 17th, 2023. Yeah, it says 22 here, but actually it should have been 23. So one of the things that we wanted to make comment on is that we want to we want to actually get with uh, the National Park Service and find out when when there will be scheduled um, comment periods, when there will be scheduled public comment periods, and these meetings will then uh, be open to the public and there will be time for public comments for everyone else. So the recommendation here, and I, I had help from Lloyd Guy, our attorney general back home, in actually uh, reviewing this, um, the changes, the proposed amendments, and getting recommendations together. So the Department of the Interior will conduct con consultation sessions with Indian tribes virtually during the comment period. The Department of Interior will announce the exact meeting dates and times of the consultation sessions, which will be scheduled. Now, our recommendation here is that um, someone will follow up with the Department of Interior because the letter to tribal leaders is sometimes not received in a timely fashion. So sometimes we get the letter a couple of weeks before and we have to scramble to get out our comments and our recommendations. So the number one is that cultural affiliation and ge geographical affiliation. The DOI is proposing defining the term affiliation and within the term taking into account both cultural and geographical affiliation rather than treat the two as distinctly different. So we recommend that the tribes indicate support for this change because it would tend to be more inclusive. And we are, as Lakota people, inclusive people. When we find, when we think of geographical affiliation, we think of the of the area covered within the section 106 of N NHPA. We, we have traced our steps all the way to the East Coast. There were Lakota artifacts that were found there. And we do have words, I was overhearing somebody uh, when I stepped in saying, we have a word for the little creeks, for the big creeks, for the rivers, for the ocean. 
why would we have a word for the ocean if we haven't been there? So we have been coast to coast and up into Canada and down, in, down south into the uh, South Central Americas. So we know that we have been moving about as people. We have traced all the way to the East Coast and then for as far as our area of concern, it would make sense for us not only to support the geographic term, but the cultural piece as well. Number two, the consultation the Department of Interior is proposing to define consultation as seeking consensus. And that is a word that, um, that I want to explain a little bit of. Consensus is when every person agrees that something is good for all. Something is good for the whole. That is true consensus to put aside your own personal belief, your own personal thinking, and think for the whole. Think for all natives, think for all indigenous groups. That is true consensus. When you, when you are able to put aside that personal belief, or personal opinion, personal desires, so that you can think for the whole group as natives. And the other thing to that too, the other issue to that too is that we were taught as natives to think ahead, to think ahead of what seven generations would look like. Are we going to leave leave this, this earth, the lands, in a good, healthy perspective for the generations to come. That is true consensus. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, so we, we, we should require a record of the consultation and why a consensus could not be achieved. The department believes that a written request for a consultation is necessary, and we will agree with that. There has to be record. I think Faith touched on a historical record. Historical record could actually be winter counts. Historical record should, could actually be an oral story. So with that being said, we recommend that we join others who have called on a definition of consultation to align with the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People or Executive Order 13175. Doing this will allow us to be consistent with our calls in the past to have the United States sign on to the United Nations Declaration of, of Rights of Indigenous People. And although we don't necessarily agree that a written request should be required, we, we also recommend that we support the written recommendation requirement because it will better prepare us in the event that we need to file a lawsuit against future administrations or against agencies. It provides us with proof that we did ask for consultation. So this written request is also important for us because we have a specific desire for these types of consultations. It must be meaningful on a government to government basis. Agencies should be required to come here to us, to us native people. Or in the alternative too, we could go there. Too often, administrations try to get away with saying they consulted with us because we were one of 200 other tribes on a conference call. And let me tell you a little bit about the conference calls. Every call that I get on, I, I personally tell them, 
This is not consultation. Please have that on record. I can only speak for my own tribe, the Sichangu. Please have that on record. These are things that we must uphold with the Department of Interior and other agencies. So number three, discovery on federal or tribal lands. Two issues were identified here, notification or consultation with Indian tribes or NHOs when a discovery occurs. And number two, the timelines for action by the appropriate official after a discovery has been made. The Department of Interior proposes written documentation within 24 hours, which can be an email, but not a text. So the recommendation that we have is that it is recommended that we join in advocating for an immediate telephone call, immediate and a written confirmation by the person who makes the discovery. An email isn't necessarily a bad thing because emails are generally time stamped, but there is a risk of an email not getting through or ending up in spam or somehow a message not getting through. A phone call followed up by an email would be the best way. It will be advantageous. Okay, so number four. Let's touch on the comprehensive agreements. Much of the discussion here and a proposal by the Department of Interior is that plans of action need to be moved to the front of the section. The recommendation, we should advocate for these comprehensive agreements to actually be comprehensive. The agreement should note cultural restrictions and take into account traditional means of how to treat remains and funerary objects of our relatives and to be tribe specific. Even though we are of the Ocheti Shakoi, we have our own traditions. We have our own perspectives as tribe. That is the beauty of the native and who we are. So we should advocate for these comprehensive agreements to actually be detailed and comprehensive. These agreements should also provide a, a reimbursement mechanism, which Rosewood Sioux Tribe didn't have. We went there to Carlisle on good faith, on good faith to bring home our little relatives. And we had to do a comprehensive, detailed budget to submit to them. And we were reimbursed. But the fact really is that we shouldn't have had to go on tribal money. There should have been a mechanism in place that would allow any tribe to go and get their relative and not have the stress of worrying where you're gonna get the funding to do it. So we need to advocate for this plan to include detailed plans as to what to do with mass graves or the graves in which more than one person is buried. The Department of Army as, as is did give the responsibility uh, to the BIA. And in this case, the Department of Army, as is the BIA's responsibility. If these aren't part of comprehensive agreements, then tribes run the risk of either having those costs not reimbursed. So let's go to number five, the control. There was much, much, much discussion about what control really means. Some interpret control as custody or legal right to possession. The Department of Interior is advocating for the use of the term or terms, control or possession. The DOI did note comments related to holding agencies and museums as jointly and severally liable 
It is also clarifying that the act was not conferring any legal right upon a Muslim, just, but just to address the apl application of the laws itself. So the recommendation we have to the issue of control or possession is adequate. We believe that the, the museums and the agencies should be jointly and severally liable for the repatriation of the remains. That should not lay on the tribes whatsoever. It is the responsibility of that particular museum, museum or the agency itself. The reason for this is that it will provide additional incentive for the agency to make certain that the museum complete or comply with the federal law. It provides tribes with an additional liable party. The clarification helps define the applicability of the law itself. We are in support of this as well. Number six, federal lands and boarding schools. This was an issue because at one time we defined Genoa as being on state land, but it did have federal funding. So we're looking at this as an example. There was some thought that the definition of federal lands in this section should be expanded to include not only federal or tribal lands where boarding schools were, but also lands that were not in the possession of the federal government, but schools that were run with federal funding. So the recommendation here is that it is recommended that while the, the Department of Interior cannot change the definition of federal lands that we advocate, that the DOI should provide for boarding schools that were simply run with government money or work with the Congress to change the wording in the NAGPRA law that will provide for anywhere that Native children were buried. And I think that is something that we need to work at in unity. We can change these laws. We can help change these laws. We can give recommendations. But ultimately, it is in the control of the legislators in Washington to change the wording in this particular case. So there are two things that connect the federal government, and it's the land or the money. Number seven, pay specific attention to 10.4 and 10.5, where it talks about discovery and timelines. THPOs should be the experts when it comes to time, time frames and such. And so we talked about some of the issues that, that we ran up against. And I believe that Rosewood Sioux Tribe actually was, uh, was able to make these recommendations from the experience that we had with Carlisle. So we want to share this and I shared everything that we went through in the process with the other tribes, with the other tipples, so that they would get, uh, get a good handle on, on things before uh, they lost any funding of their own, just to, uh, just to make sure that their relatives were, were brought home. So the NAGPRA actually includes or should include customary laws. Customary laws being from the Teoshpayas of the native people. And it should include intellectual property. USD is a very good example of giving back intellectual property. So we're looking at maybe establishing protocols from each tribe as to how they want their relatives brought home. 
And I'll give you an example of that. As I was receiving a degree, I took a course in ethics. Ethics for cultural resource management. And that included NAGPRA and bringing home relatives. So I had some people in my life, some uncles, Victor DeVille, Albert Whitehat, and I had a grandfather, a grandpa, Leonard Crowdog, set me down and tell me that when you do repatriation, when you bring relatives home, there was never an if. There was that word, when, when you do. And it is coming for you. These are the things that you need to do in preparation for bringing them home. There is a certain ceremony that you must do. There is that ceremony that you must complete before you go after the relatives. So in our own ways, in our own native tribes, we have those protocols that we live by, that we carry. And <clears throat> then we had, a, we had a gentleman from um, Standing Rock, Cedric Goodhouse. And he was explaining the artifacts from the Bar uh, Massachusetts uh, Museum. And the conversation there was that it got political. And any repatriation case, this is a sacred way. There is sacredness attached to bringing home relatives. There is no room for politics. And he agrees, I agree, all the THPOs agreed. There is no room, no room for politics within the repatriation process. So it, it was a very, very good and hard discussion that we had with the NAGPRA issue. Now we're having people sending us home things. There was a box that came into our office at Sichanku. No return address, no letter, no explanation. When the box was opened, in the box was a gold stand shirt, a small one, small, very small meant for a small person. And so we had a brother of mine, Richard Dickey Moskamp. He went to lodge, and then he came to the office, and he explained that that ghost dance shirt belonged to a 14-year-old boy. And that 14-year-old boy He went through the ghost dance so that his people could live and the animals could live and the plants could live. A 14-year-old boy wanting that for his people. It is sad that we probably don't have any 14-year-old now thinking of his people, thinking of the plants, the animals, but he did. So we have the shirt within, with the local museum there, and we are having the uh, Rosewood Sioux Tribe is having a collaboration with the uh, Catholic Church-owned museum there in Rosebud. 
in St. Francis to be detailed. And that is where we have a couple of uh, other shirts. Uh, one of my brothers, Duane Hollihorn Bear, he went through two international repatriation processes to bring home two shirts. And we have them there. So this repatriation process is ongoing and it's, it's picked up some speed. I mean, people are just sending things that they have in their attic or in their museums. And we're grateful for the people that, that stand up and say, I'm sorry, this belongs to your people. That is such a positive way to go. So we went on into, um, and NAICPRA seemed to take up a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of discussion. And one of the discussions that we had was actually the, uh, the UND and the remains found there, found or discovered. How could you not know what is in your home? They knew, they had to know. They were there for years and years, and all of a sudden they found them. So that didn't sit well with me, but everybody needs to look in their closets, everyone, in their attics, in their closets. Our people need to come home to their lands. And somebody told me, our tribe does not believe in disinterment. Our tribe does not believe in bringing home remains. And this is what I had to tell them, tell him particularly, that you think that your people's remains are lying in peace but I have something to tell you. They were already disturbed. They were already moved from one cemetery to another, they say. I'm saying they got moved from one to a second one and now to the third. They have been disturbed two times. And why, why would you want to have a relative laying in someone's yard, laying there unwanted, unwanted. And that is my word. That is the word I choose. So we have to all as tribes, take a look at where your relatives are. Take them home, take them home. Because this law does not apply to private landowners. They can plow up the burials if they choose and plant whatever money-making thing they have there. They can, and they have. So there needs to be a change in that NAGPRA law that says private landowners you have something on your land, it goes home to the people. And if that's an indigenous land that you have, which is true for the whole United States, it all belongs to the native tribes. So wherever we bury our people, they should be able to protect that. They should be able to keep that in preservation. But sometimes these landowners do not have the ability to comprehend sacred places, to the Wakan places, if you will. So that, that conversation actually needs to be ongoing. 
And it cannot be ongoing for 10 years or 20 years or even five years. It has to start right now. Right now is the time to take that step. Take that, that next step and actually make them live up to NAGPRA, live up to this law. So then we, we discussed the UND and the Kansas University repatriation, and um, Faith was able to enlighten us on the things that were going on there. But I'll tell you what, there was, uh, there is a case with the Peabody Museum. And there, 750 locks of hair. And the first time that I heard of it, and I looked into the website, they had names of the children. And somebody made a comment that that shouldn't be out there, so they took the names off. However, a lot of people saw the names of their relatives before they took it off. And the purpose behind that was to study DNA. They were going to study us and compare us to the Mongolians. How dare they? I think that their, their thought at the time was that they were trying to prove that we, that we actually did come from the Bering Strait and that we, we were not here as a di indigenous people. So that, that will be addressed. That will be addressed in the future. We're, we are not going to sit down and let that, let that go on. So with that, with that, I will leave you with a quote from 2006. Grandpa Leonard Crowdog, quote, the land does not belong to you. You belong to the land, unquote. Ho pilamayapi. Do we have questions? I have a question. Uh, I own this quad, hmm. two oak. Um, a while ago, I did some consultant work for Haskell, Lawrence, Kansas. And I spoke to, well, first of all, uh, during the time I was there in the summer, um, I kept hearing these kids laugh and playing outside in the hallways. I went to peek out and I could hear them, I could see them run around the corner and so finally, I asked my boss, Dr. Godfrey, at that time, 1998, I asked him, I said, is there any kids around here? I keep hearing these kids and seeing these kids playing around outside. His eyes went big. He said, go talk to the science teacher. So I did. And the science teacher said that at one time, it used to be a boarding school. And he took a group of students out west, on the west of Lawrence, uh, west of Haskell, to do a science project in the swampland and found these, uh, when they covered, uncovered some bones, and there were fractured skulls, broken ribs, and he was trying to piece together. He covered them that back up. And he was trying to um, check the records because a lot of the boarding schools put down, ran away. When the truth was they were physically abused so bad you know, that they died. And so they were buried. Uh, so, I mentioned this late, years later, um, I, I, 
I wanted to know where that science teacher went. I asked questions. He said he wanted to kind of keep a lid, a lid on it for a while because he might get fired. Um, I asked him to check. Well, anyway, I, I talked to um, the past historic preservation officer and I asked him to check into it for me. Uh, I don't know where that went, but uh, that's the first one. The second one um, that uh, that I became aware of um, more so was um, uh, the 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 kids that are um, in our boarding schools. Uh, how it went from the the um, the from Carlisle to other boarding schools came to dime size to the smaller ones. My grandfather was a survivor of um, uh, Carlisle, and uh, I went to. I was in Washington D.C. Uh, I snagged. <laughs> I almost got married to a Micmac. But uh, <laughs> I ran away. Oh. <laughs> um, I got I got interested in Carlisle. I was that close, so we went up there and visited Carlisle. And uh, I spoke with the uh, the um, person in charge at that time, and they were planning on having a, a reunion of past graduates. Um, to come back and have a powwow. So at that time, I suggested to her, I said, no, we don't need a powwow. I said, you need to have like four years of healing, healing what happened here in Carlisle. I visited the, the cells, ones completely... Uh, has no windows, then right across the hall, uh, there's one that has windows. And my grandfather survived that for six years. He hung on to his Wolakota, and that's what he brought back. And later on told my father, and my father told me these stories and what happened. So I just wanted to share that today, that, you know, this healing work uh, we need to cry. We need to let uh, these tear out, tears out, because I believe their spirits, you know, are looking for that love that uh, they they were taken from their their homes and they never were, um, and they were disconnected. I always believe in this umbilical cord of love that comes from the mom. And when that severed, uh, our nazi uh, is really goes through some hardship. So anyway, I just wanted to share that today. I want to thank you for your work. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I too <coughs> have <coughs> have some concerns and went through a process of grieving. Um, one of the nine children that came home from Carlisle was actually from my family. And my uncle, uh, Dr. Eric LaPointe, did the research and provided me with a copy of everything and how he was related to me. You know, uh, my mother taught me some words. One of them was which, uh, uh, the relationships between people. And then she said, but remember this one. We chose wet the same blood. And that is the, one of the little ones that came home. But it was, it, it was painful to sit there and watch them come out and realize that some of them were, had experienced some painful things. And my own little relative went through 
an autopsy. And that there was evidence of that, that they had uh, taken the top portion of his skull that was cut. And so I asked for the autopsy report. There was no record of it. They couldn't find a record of it. My own grandfather who raised me from the Oglala side, he had a limp. And when I asked him how he got that, his answer to me was, oh, I was riding a horseback in the rodeo and I fell off. But my oldest brother, who was raised by my grandpa as well, he told me years later, did grandpa ever tell you what happened to him? It seemed that um, my grandfather was one of the boys in Carlisle that was put in charge of uh, horses. They were to break horses. He fell off, broke his hip and a leg, and they left him in an infirmary for a couple of weeks, and then they shipped him home. And that's how he came home. So all of those things actually had a personal issue with me because of my own people, my own blood being there. And so when I was on a, um, on a call with uh, Deb Holland and her staff, one of the questions was, what could we do in terms of reparation? So when I made a comment, I told them, there is no amount of money. There is no amount of money that will make these things right. You've broken up families. The little ones buried there. They had a future that they never fulfilled. How do you make reparation on that? They left the hole in their families back home. A mother died wondering what happened to her son. Relatives passed on not knowing where their little relative was buried or what happened to them. How do you make reparation on, the, on that? Yes, there's a healing process. But how do you heal the past? I want to know. Because it is challenging. It is difficult knowing what your relatives went through. And I could imagine my own grandfather saying, ah, ito kashnyo hena, ito kashnyo, tuksha, ichelienkta. Things will get better. Never mind. But I, I think of the kindness that he gave me. And I wonder, how could he be so kind and loving after what he went through. But that is the true resilience of our people. In spite of and in light of the things that we went through, we are here. We're here. Dukshataku ashtikte. Gopila. Okay, um, next presenter, Joe Her. Ear Shut Up, and that's what he told me, so he said shut up, but I didn't want to say that. Huh? This will be the last presenter. Yeah. This will be the last presenter. We're uh, limited on time too, so. 
Is a gonna snagging you will like a dish near you. Where is that one at? That crazy cloud. What snag your head? Telling on himself. Oh, you like a car. IT people come in. You have a straight HDMI out. Can you hear me? Thank you. Tata Uriata, Kanani, Chere, Simarani, Harupani, Hatixi, Kahi Sesi, Hamashaka, Ini Huriata Quahembo, Hi Puripecheska, Kahuchate, Tatecha, Ariqua Hisinti, Carmen Welly, Maria, Hiring Shinga, Joseph Hirshada, Tate Kichi and Aji. My name is Joseph Hirshada. I am of Mexican background and Purepecha descent, a tribe from Mexico. My wife and children are enrolled on the Shine River Sioux Reservation, and uh, I'm giving this talk entitled The New Black Hills Taking Indigenous Data Sovereignty and What Northern Plain Tribes Need to Know with Dr. Stephanie Littlehawk Big Crow. Okay. Uh huh. I'm pretty much the Madaku Yape, Stephanie Ohitikawi Chinkala, Chetan Chinkala, Ni Kangi Tanka, um, Mimachiape, Mitios by Metawaki, Aglala la Kota Hemachello, um, Menilusaha on Tama He, Ni Wakpamani District, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, um, Alwa Tipi, um, Ni Wakpamani District, a uh, Pine Ridge, uh, uh, Oglala Lakota Territories, Imantaha. Um, just wanted to summarize my introduction real quick. Uh, good, uh, good evening, uh, my relatives. I see all my unchis, my gakas. Pilamiai um, Lakshi uh, for always hosting and for all my uh, gakas and unchis and lakshis and twins in here um, for continually con taking this space and making this space for us. Um, I'm originally from uh, Wakpamani district. Um, my ate is Timothy Bickrose, I am, um, and my uh, unchi is uh, from the Little Hawk Teoshbai, so I carry both last names. Um, I have a doctorate in business administration. I focused on the legal protections of indigenous biogenetics, specifically urban indigenous peoples using behavioral economics. Um, I'm in a uh, volunteer and an actual uh, support for uh, Joseph uh, Yaracherda. Yaracherda, that's what he's trying to say. Um, but uh, I come here today and um, fully support um, the advancements in uh, truly obtaining economic sovereignty as indigenous peoples in the 21st century and looking seven generations ahead. And so um, with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, I'm just going to call him Big Head, but... <laughs> We're good friends. So I'm, uh, again, I'm thankful for uh, Tahashi, Phil, for inviting me again. Last year, I spoke uh, about this time, you know, last in the cleanup. I was batting cleanup in the, in the presentations. 
Um, but I'm happy to hear all the talks I've heard today about different aspects of indigenous data sovereignty, and that's what uh, we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to kind of fly through this because we are limited on time, and I want to get to the last slide, which is um, trying to get the Ocheti Shakoin to uh, sign off or modify or somehow adopt a declaration of indigenous data sovereignty for uh, the region. So again, my name is Joseph Irasheta. Uh, my indigenous background is Purepecha, otherwise known as Tarascan, which is what the Spanish called us. And um, Daro, uh, Raramuri, the ones that run the really long races, uh, which are commonly known as Tarumara, which also the Spanish gave us that name. Um, if Before I go on, if you want to look at more of this stuff in depth, we have lots of videos on YouTube. Uh, you just have to type in native bio or native bio data into the YouTube search field and you can find us. Um, so a lot of people know about the horrors of Nazi Germany and what happened to uh, the Jewish people there during the Nuremberg trials, Nuremberg trials during research. Uh, and there's lots of books on that, and it's actually the basis for the ethics policy in the United States is based on what the Germans did to the Jewish people. People also know about what happened to African Americans in this country and the Tuskegee syphilis experiment where they were experimented on, uh, where they just let syphilis go on without treating them. Uh, once that was found out, they moved the, they moved the study to Guatemala. Um, and then right now, uh, in this era that we're in, in big data and collecting biological information, actually started with this woman, Henrietta Lacks. She was a black woman who went to Johns Hopkins for a very um, resistant cancer, and they took some tissue from her, and it was because of her tissue, her tumor, that would not die, that we are now in the predicament we're in today. Because of her cells, they were able to propagate them. They're still alive today, so a piece of her is still alive today and allowed science to move forward on all kinds of things, including genetics. Um, but what people don't know about is what happened to Native people in the Americas or the United States. Um, this slide talks about the forced sterilization of Native women that happened all the way till 1975. Um, then we also know that in, similar to the syphilis experiments, natives were allowed to have tuberculosis without any treatment also into the 70s. And it wasn't until native nurses in the Southwest and here in the Dakotas where they decided to treat their own people with the proper medication so that the tuberculosis pandemic would end. Um, so we don't know about, most people don't know about that. Um, and then it continued on even uh, after World War II uh, in Alaska with our native relatives in Alaska that they were experimented on for uh, nuclear fallout experiments. Uh, rather than doing this experiment with soldiers, they did it with the uh, natives of Alaska where they treated them with radioactivity to see how they would do. Um, and then modern, after the... Um, human genome was matched, mapped in 2003, um, this case came up with the Havasupai where Arizona State University used samples from the Havasupai in an unethical and unregulated and uh, non-permissive matter where um, the Havasupai objected, they sued the university, they settled out of court for $700,000. Uh, and at the same time, it happened with the New Chal North in British Columbia, and they had a fight or an argument with the uh, University of Utah, but they got their samples back. The Yanomami in Brazil, same thing, they got their samples back. Uh, but then now it's been happening with COVID, IHS, and Big Pharma. So some tribes have, and because the CDC and IHS was so slow to provide any treatment or testing, some tribes entered into agreements with Big Pharma to do vaccine testing, but they didn't know that they signed away the rights to their DNA, all of their people's DNA. So that's something that's being pursued. IHS, at least in this region, has declared that they own your COVID data which myself and my colleagues said, no, that's not true. That belongs to the tribe. That's a fight that's ongoing. And then just, uh, we just found out a couple of weeks ago that Tulalip paid for their own research. They paid $3 million to Stanford to help them with um, substance abuse. They came up with a solution and then Stanford tried to patent it. 
And so they went to court, they settled out of court. Uh, right now, we don't know how much they settled out of court for, but Stanford basically tried to steal this economic and this uh, pharmaceutical benefit from the Tulalip tribe in, in Washington state. Um, so I'm gonna skip over some of this stuff. Um, so indigenous data sovereignty is a big thing now, not just in the United States, but all over the world, which we heard today. Um, the Obama administration, the Clinton administration, the Biden administration are supporting proper tribal consultation. And you heard in the last speaker, tribal consultation is not happening correctly, but um, it has been supported by executive order. Um, this is just a, a slide. Myself and my colleagues wrote two papers basically saying that up until now, and including now, Native people have been exploited by research rather than being helped by research. And, the, and all of this is happening in a legal landscape that started in the 80s with the Bayh-Dole Act. The Bayh-Dole Act says basically that anything the United States pays for, pays for, they own, including tribal data. And that was uh, reinforced by federal law H.R. 2272, which took seven years to pass. But that also says that your data belongs to not only the United States, but the world. It's called open access, open data. The third thing that's going on is that tribes don't regulate and these IRBs, their ethical review boards for universities uh, um, employed or deployed by the United States Federal Service, they're not legal entities, but people think that they are. And so often researchers don't know who they should ask permission from. Do they ask permission from the university, from the NIH, from the tribe, whatever. And then it's even worse in urban settings uh, because a lot of Native people get referred out by Indian Health Service and then they get uh, preyed upon by universities or doctors in those settings uh, and they often aren't explained to what it means to participate or give tissue away in research. And right now the University of Michigan uh, and the state of Michigan passed a law saying that if you have discarded tissue, so if you have a foot removed, if you have a piece of liver removed, if you have a uh, cancerous tumor biopsied, that becomes property of the University of Michigan because it's garbage, it's human waste. They don't have to ask your permission. Um, let's see. Um, the other thing is like the previous speaker was talking about these, in order to get around tribal sovereignty, they're going to museums. And so all of these um, remains on screen uh, are already genetically sequenced and no tribe was really consulted other than Kennewick Man, which is the one in Washington state. All of these are in public databases and no tribe really has control over the, our ancient relatives. And then in, um, what was it, 2009 or 2007, Stanford on its own with National Geographic collected all of these samples. So the basis for 23andMe and Ancestry.com are all of the native relatives essential in South America. So when somebody gets a report back from 23andMe that they're Native American, it really means those samples, those living people from Central and South America. And this is a big business, of course. It's one of the best selling products of 23andMe and Ancestry.com is whether or not people have Native American ancestry and it is big, big money. So like I said earlier, the country and most of the world has gone to this open data and open access for format without real consultation with the tribes. Um, on the left there, well, yeah, right for you, left for me. Um, that is the scientific reasons for open data access, but no tribes have really been consulted. And there is a huge economic benefit. The USA wants data sharing. They want open access. They want data sovereignty. But tribes have not been consulted uh, properly on this process for open access, open data, or data sharing policies. Um, this is being used in criminal forensics and the CIA and the FBI and other people are putting pressure on these companies to share this data when it's by contract. When you send in your DNA, it's supposed to be private, but they've already forced these companies to give data so that they can find criminals. And some of my lawyer friends said that that is a legal search and seizure. The All of Us Research Program wants to collect a million genomes. They did a really bad data 
sharing engagement consultation with, uh, I think it was like 17 representatives of tribes, 17 representatives that like the previous speaker said, uh, those 17 people don't speak for 574 tribes, but that's how the NIH thinks. Uh, then there's the Million Veterans Program. They've, they're already at 1.2 million genomes, and they won't tell us how many of those genomes are native. Um, and NCAI has started to work towards this and putting out resolutions so that tribes can adopt this language, basically telling the get federal government to cease, cease and desist collecting this information without proper tribal consultation. Right now, there are 11, 11 indigenous data sovereignty resolutions and counting uh, all on these issues. So some of the issues that we talked about today, uh, internet, um, NAGPRA, um, research data from the environment, research data from traditional knowledge, uh, research data from boarding schools, all of that stuff has something from NCI telling the government that they need to stop doing that without proper consultation. And if you look at the MLAI, that means machine learning and AI, the ability for computers to data scrape all the information you put on the internet, and they, somebody was talking about digital twinning earlier. Digital twinning allows them to get around tribal sovereignty by just getting publicly available data and making a virtual tribal citizen and using that data for whatever they want. Uh, we, the NBDC, we work with First Nations, uh, Mati and Inuit in Cata Cata uh, sorry, Canada. We've been working in Ontario. We've been working in British Columbia, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Alberta on these same issues. Um, so. Why do we need a place like the Native Biodata Consortium? It's for all of these reasons here. Uh, it's a human rights issue. We need uh, genomic discretion, genomic governance, genomic translation, genomic implementation. Alternative research solutions, people um, were talking about that today. Instead of talking about only going to a hospital to figure out how, why you're sick or, or how to fix you. We want preventative strategies so people don't get sick in the first place, and then try to figure out among us in our community who's healthy, why they're healthy, rather than doing research on why people are sick. And all of it should be under the umbrella of tribal sovereignty. Uh, I'm gonna skip these slides. Um, this one's a good slide. So we have partners uh, all across the country that are talking about indigenous data sovereignty and all of the data that should belong to the tribes. Not that the tribes shouldn't share some of it, but tribes should decide what to share and when, and how to call that, back, that data back when the data is being abused. So normally people only think about the tribal data, which is on the far end over there, but they don't think about all the other data that's collected on their behalf, business data, uh, government data and public health, licensing, fish and wildlife. Um, and then what I've been talking about is mostly university research-based data. But all of that data should be under the umbrella of tribal sovereignty. Uh, just like, again, the, the previous, uh, all everybody today was talking about it in some fashion. Why is data sovereignty important? Uh, we have to repatriate all of our old data and all of the artifacts like uh, um, Ms. Quigley was talking about. Uh, it's our culture, our beliefs, our communities needs to define and consent and protect our data and our bodies from exploitation by outsiders, empower the tribes and native owned entities to gather, collect um, data that serves the tribe, including lawsuits, including entrepreneurship, empower the tribe and native owned entities to develop their own electoral property rules and patents and grow the data and the economy and uh, tribal culture of uh, most native communities. Uh, just quickly, who we are, our board members are all indigenous from somewhere. Uh, some are from the United States, some are from Canada, um, some are from Hawaii, um, some are from New Zealand, some are from Mexico, and uh, you see there, uh, Richard Myers is right here in Rapid City. Uh, he's an Ogallala member. And all of our uh, community advisory members, which we have one here, Manny Ironhawk, uh, he's a community advisor member. All our community advisor members are from Shine River. So we want to keep the samples protected. We want to keep the data local. We want to build tribal capacity in every field, law, science, medicine. Um, we want to foster more trust in research and do research that tribes want to have done. Um, and we are honored, we're doing it inside the border, the legal and geographic border of the Shine River Sioux Reservation. Um, 
We're a 501c3, so we're not out to make money. We're out to protect. Um, we want to collaborate or put together data sets that will actually help and ask these questions over time, whether it's water making us sick or whether or not we have samples like uh, the samples Ms. Quigley was talking about to say how we've changed over time and if we can prove our case to the US government that they made us sick. All of these things we have goals. Uh, we do qualitative research by asking people like yourselves whether or not they wanna do this research, who should be responsible, who should um, govern it, all of those kinds of things. Uh, um, Bryce in the woods is here. We're helping him. We're, we're not getting anything from this. It's all for the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. We're helping him stand up a public health department, which a lot of tribes have done during COVID because they, they got all this extra money. Um, and not every tribe has a public health department. A public health department can solve a lot of these issues for the tribe. Um, so it, it recognizes sovereignty because states and federal governments and cities already have the sovereignty to protect the public health and safety. It automates your preparation so you don't have to wait like we had to wait for COVID. China River had to wait until I think September to get any testing at all when the epidemic started in January. Uh, it prioritizes tribal authority so that they can make those decisions without waiting for the IHS, without waiting for the CDC. Um, we are doing surveillance, so we're doing making sure that the tests work on the reservation, and then nobody's doing sequencing, like very few people are doing sequencing in the United States anyway, but we're sequencing the virus to make sure the variants that are uh, showing up on Cheyenne River aren't especially harmful, and then um, if they are, we can tell people to quarantine the right way, so we're doing sequencing. Nobody's doing that in a tribal capacity except for us. Um, we also do training, so we have this thing called the Summer Internship for uh, Indigenous People in Genomics, which has branches in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Chile, and uh, soon to be uh, Greenland. So we're training students, lawyers, public health people, uh, business people, all about genetics. And what that means, we're training uh, high school and middle school students on STEM activities. We have something called Indigidata that uh, we're also tr um, training uh, students on how to use data and what their responsibility as indigenous students uh, are to the data and to tribes. Uh, this is a slide that just talks about all the things we do. We also want to help return and repatriate and give tribes enough time to decide what they want to do with those samples if they want to bury them or do ceremony or if they want to continue using them, that's up to them. But the problem is, is that the feds don't give you enough time to decide. If you don't decide or you don't answer their email or you don't answer their phone call, they just take it. So we don't want that to happen anymore. We want to be able to store it. Uh, and then this one is, um, this happened actually way back in 2009, but the data was just published last year. A scientist from Denmark came over to uh, Standing Rock and asked this gentleman if he could sequence Sitting Bull, and it happened. Um, as far as I know, the original hair sample was buried somewhere on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, um, but the data for this was published um, in a couple of papers already, and the, the raw data, I think, is still in uh, uh, University of Cambridge. Um, so I'm not really sure who's paying attention if the Sandy Rock Sioux Council or who's making sure that that data is repatriated and put back where it's supposed to go. Um, but we also are endeavoring with several different uh, companies and partners to try and build our own server. Somebody mentioned that earlier. Um, we want to have a server that's on the reservation so that that data is ensured to be protected. And we're also looking into trying to have our own little piece of the cloud so that it's just a tribal cloud. Um, there's all kinds of things that can benefit from us existing that we wouldn't benefit from, but people around us could have equipment that's needed for research, that what we need for research. Um, for the tribes that have wind energy, your first customer would be us and the server farm. Um, like I said, we, we can build all kinds of infrastructure around uh, data security. Um, we can build conference centers, hotels, restaurants, all of those kinds of things just because you centralize the research and the data on a reservation. All of this stuff can help 
tribal economies. Uh, so our goals as the NBDC is to increase awareness of who we are and where we are, why we are, and that we have the uh, Shiner or Sioux tribes um, approval to operate, expand our assistance to all the tribes in the Northern Plains, provide a safe harbor for whoever asks, expand our network of mutually productive collaborations like the people who spoke here earlier today. And there's this old saying that in order to claim and assert sovereignty, you have to control your land. So the United States said, sure, have the land, but we're gonna take away your food and water. So now sovereignty means you have to have land, you have to have food, you have to have water. And then they said, okay, you have land and food and water, but we're gonna take your kids away and we're gonna turn them into us. So now you're like, well, sovereignty means we have to control the land, we have to control our food and water, we have to control our children's education. And then the United States says, well, you can have all those things, but we're gonna take your data because your data is gonna tell us where the water is, where the gold is, where the botanical plants are, the medicinal plants, all that stuff. It's gonna, so allow sovereignty has to include land, food and water, education for your children and your data. So um, I kind of invented the saying, inventory is the foundation of sovereignty, meaning you have to count up everything that you have, right? What you claim as yours. Uh, but categorization, what that data means, that's up to you. And how that data is used, that's up to you. Um, and this is the declaration that uh, myself and Dr. Uh, Big Crow wrote together. Uh, I don't know that we have time to go through it, but I did send it uh, by email to Tahanshi Phil. I don't know if we want to go through it or do you want to go through it at all? Or if you have anything to say. Um, just... Um Looking at um, kind of to summarize it is to in order for us and this was written in the United Nations Special Rapporteur um, by Kretzfeld in actually 1978 and he states that in order for um, in order for tribal nations to assert uh, the cultural protections uh, cultural protections require sovereign rights and in order and vice versa the sovereign rights of tribal nations requires cultural protections. Either or cannot exist without the other. So it is vital that whether or not this form of cultural protections comes in this digital format, when um, my um, when Joe when when he was mentioning the digital age of um, um, and I know he didn't get too much into it, but artificial intelligence, we look at what economic data has done, and we have already been involved in this um, what they call bioethics or bioeconomics. And this is a uh, path that has been being exploited by uh, big data or big government. So those investors who actually invest in these algorithms from Google to the, you know, um, unraveling the human genome, they've actually in invested in these particular platforms knowing that the rate of return would be 100 times more than what they particularly invest because the money, the trillions of dollars that's invested in bio bioeconomics and big data on bio, advancements in bio, um, re, um, biogenetic research is extremely huge. And um, just wanting to mention one more other thing is that what we will, um, what we could actually expand this into, and my Tuwe was actually mentioning early, earlier in terms of how do we really assert the intellectual property that's embedded in our Lakota, Dakota, Nakota language. When we know that our language is a living language, it asserts energy. It depends on first person, second person who I'm speaking to. So that intellectual property that's known under the World Intellectual Property Organization as AKA traditional knowledge, our cultural heritage knowledge. So as Joe was mentioning, they try to shift up terms on us and we have to act fast. But it's worth trillions of dollars in the global genomic industry. It's actually, um, Everything from, and I say everything, meaning from our DNA to our spirituality, to our nachi. If they could bottle our nachi and sell it and exploit it, they would. And so within this, this is just a basic format, and we're definitely open, and would, I know um, Lexi will probably share a copy uh, with the council to read. We definitely would like this, and I would recommend that we would translate this, majority of it, 51%, should be written in the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota languages. It, it needs to be written in our language in order for us to, and from a legal perspective, be considered the authoritarian or the experts, if you will, in the translation.
but this is definitely um, open for um, opportunity just for engagement, and I'll let Joe continue. Samia. So, um, if, if you guys know anything about the National Congress of American Indians, uh, and a lot of, oh, yeah, just a second, Manny. Um, if you know anything about the National Congress of American Indians, a lot of people feel like it's an organization that can't get a lot done, but they, their reputation goes up and down. They've definitely acted in terms of foster care and adoption and, and tried to slow that down or prevent that from happening. They've also uh, helped with casino gaming and um, gas tax, and right now they're, they're doing well with missing and murdered Indigenous persons advocating on those kinds of things. But no matter how you feel about these kinds of declarations and documents, um, I don't, but uh, Dr. Big Crow has more experience of actually going to the United Nations. And we just sent somebody to Montreal for the United, United Nations COP15, which is protecting uh, biodiversity of plants and animals, especially in indigenous spaces like the, the one woman who was here earlier talking about. Um, there was also COP27, which was about climate change. So these documents, even though they feel like they don't have a lot of um, energy behind them or, or, or success behind them, they do because it allows us as advocates to go to these places and say, this is what the people want. This is what the people think. This is what the people feel. And so all of the, the um, resolutions from NCAI, I'll, I'm happy to share with Ojeti Shakoi um, and, and just bundle them together and send it an email. And if this one gets uh, signed and passed, that would also be uh, some ammunition in our, in our holster um, to try and slow some of these things down. But anyway, uh, Manny, you're going to ask a question. Uh -huh. uh, well, uh, uh, being uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, community advisory board members back home, this opened my eyes. And up until that time, uh, one of my resources was a Time magazine <laughs> on anything with science and even though I have a degree, uh, it's not emphasized in uh, anything with science. So I have to read and, 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 and inform myself. And uh, if I have a question on DNA, I usually ask Joe to explain it to me in layman's terms. And I try to make that connection. Um, so uh, this brings up uh, IHS. We all go to IHS and they take our blood and uh, they're supposed to destroy it, but uh, we don't know. So yeah, you're gonna have to be uh, careful with that and all these um, studies being done too. Uh, you gotta read up on that and uh, See what they're gonna do with that data. It's your blood that's on there. Uh, uh, you you mentioned Nari. So Nari to me Nari he we I crack it. The blood and the Nari are the same. And we kile. It's it's the I guess it's the most. Uh, important thing you know, is, our, is our blood. And uh, we cannot let anybody take it and steal it and do what they want with it and sell it or whatever. You know, we have to be careful on it. I read, uh, I picked up a uh, Rapid City Journal, I think it was uh, when, uh, Tuesday? And, and I don't know why I took it. And here, sure enough, there was an article on DNA. And this Holocaust survivor, she was pretty young. And she went through uh, all this uh, being placed everywhere. And, and uh, she, they couldn't find no relatives for her. So guess what they did? DNA, they found some relatives. 
So that's out there, and I, I'm glad Joe mentioned Sitting Bull. Because some of our Hunkpapa uh, relatives were here. They need to be aware of those, and it's still out there. What they're going to do with it? They'll probably lie to you if you ask for it back. And uh, we have to just be really be careful about that. But uh, that pretty much, uh, and the other job that we have is to um, try to convince our tribal councils. And, and we really need to do education with our councils for them to understand how important this is. And, and you really need the protection for our DNA and each reservation. And the council are the one that needs to do that. So um, we, we just have our, uh, we just have to start educating everybody in that area. So anyway, um, uh, oh, Renee came back. I was going to make her talk too. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, this uh, DNA, you know, um, uh, you, you, I don't know how to say it, but in uh, Lakota, we need our uh, Lakota, Leweki, Lena, Ungluha, Pictin, Daya, Unkichaya, Pictin, even with the bloody nose. You know, we take care of that. And we just don't let it sit anywhere. We just keep that. And um, I'm so I'm glad that uh, uh, most of you are staying here and listening to this. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll go home and share and uh, spread the word on this uh, DNA and how important it is. So. Renee, you need to say something. Um, I can just. Oh, sorry. Um, I just want to say that, you know, we've served with the CAB as board advisory board members, and we really think it's important that um, our tribes get on board. Oh, there you know, it is. Yeah. With the um, genetics and stuff, because um, it is like a new frontier mm -hmm. for people. And just being on the advisory board, I've learned a lot about how in our genetics, you know, um, when we go to the trainings and stuff, that, that DNA, we're like 99.9%, .9%, um, all humans are the same. And just 1% makes us look different, you know, sound different, things like that, those characteristics. And so... I think it's really important that the information regarding DNA gets out there to a lot more people so that we can work within like unity among all of us, not just Lakotas, Dakotas, Nakotas, but the South American, all the people, um, indigenous people. If we can come back to ourselves and who we are, we have a lot to give to the world. So I just want to make sure and put that plug in for us because we need to find our way back to how our ancestors, our grandparents, great-grandparents, how they lived with the earth. And I think your job is important in being able to help us to find our way. So thank you. Appreciate what um, you do. I mean, oh, thank you. Um, this gentleman had a okay, question. Uh, my name is Dick Nose, Ogallala Tahawahilo. I want to say something, just to think about it. The God, Tawakantanga, He created a man and what he could do so this man could move around. Wasia, we oh, Beata, Wasiata, we oh, him, Paitoka, Machpia, Namankayoko. The God create air all directions. Okay. We are an indigenous people. 
We are a sovereign people. We are the landowners of this hemisphere. We are the landowners. If you look east, Pacific Ocean, right across the Atlantic Ocean, and you go north, we go east, all indigenous people, we the landowners. So who came to our Indian land? And who, who came and claimed the land? That's not true. That's not true. Some friends, friends, they came from Europe someplace. They got a black book. And they got an iron hole on one hand. And what does it say? Thou shalt not kill. And they use that iron to kill us. 1890. Our people, our ancestors, massacre at Wounded Knee. We still remember. We still remember. And yet, on the other hand, the black book. What does the black book say? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. They stole our black kills. So we are the landowners. Remember, remember, sovereignty is you, each and every one of us, indigenous, and we are sovereign people. Oh, Wopila. Yeah, thank you. And I think, um, uh, you know, I've been doing this since 1990. And um, I, you know, it doesn't matter if it's here or in New Zealand with the Maori or um, in Alaska, uh, Native people don't like to own things. They don't want to claim these things. And I understand that. Um, but if you don't do something, then it's all going to be owned by wealthy people. And I don't know what the cultural solution to that is. Is it a temporary ownership uh, and then you'll share later? I'm not sure. But this is all moving so fast that tribes have to do something now. The COP15, which just ended this week, for all of the other life on the planet that's not human, the idea there is that in 10 years, with only $315 million, which is not a lot of money, $315 million, they will sequence every single leaving thing on the planet. And even though they're saying it's going to be in the commons, like right now water is in the commons, uh, that it's going to be there for everybody, we know that's not true. Things that in the, are in the commons get privatized. Water is being privatized. So if they do sequence every single living thing on the planet for such a low, low price in such a short, short time, I don't think that their goal is to share that with everybody. I think their goal is to privatize it. That's just my opinion, but you guys need to know this and figure out how you're going to act and how quickly you're going to act. And to um, Mr. Ironhawk's um, comments about IHS, my experience is that when I go to the Pacific Northwest, when I go to the Southwest, when I go to California, when I go to Oklahoma, IHS is way more respectful, way more respectful than they are here in the Northern Plains. In those places, you could ask Dr. Big Crow because um, she's had some of these arguments down in Arizona. It seems like in those other places, maybe because the tribes are bigger, maybe because they have casinos, in those other places, IHS is way more respectful. Here, IHS says, we can do what we want. And that's something that has to stop, in my opinion. And so just to add, um, I think for me, I start getting into this work because of my fear of the unknown. And the question I would bring and present before each of you, who are a gener you know, the generations ahead of me, I am scared. I have obtained so much, you know, this washichu, they say, you know, this wogakapi, this knowledge. You know, but what it does for me is it just already reaffirms what I've been told by each generation before me. 
And having been raised um, in Wakbamani my entire life, and I look at what they're doing in advancements in biogenetics, they're actually using metaphysical um, biophysics. When we talk about what, where we go into Inipi to, to you know, speak to Tunkashila, you know, the energies, they're actually proving and using in biophysics. And um, Dr., um, one of our doctors from up in uh, British Columbia, I forget his last name, um, he mentions uh, how, um, if we can give an, a, a kind of a, um, an example, on Alice in Wonderland, you know how the cat's uh, head appears in one part of the branch in the tree, and then the tail appears in another area? That's called transference or tunneling in biophysics. And they're actually using that, and they have been, meaning Arizona State University, since 2015, to speed up the process of genetic sequencing. Because eventually, they want to make these new indigenized or the digital natives of Tona, you know, many, you know, Gana years ago. They want to make that new, the new digital native of tomorrow. And there's so much more that we know. And when I say intellectual property or traditional knowledge, um, when I speak at these forums, there's usually no one else with me because no one else wants to take the time. And there's very few of us that go out and learn these, these what I call pseudosciences. But it's all in our language. And I've used my, my um, credentials to testify before the South Dakota State Legislature and the Veterans Affairs Committee to pass uh, the resolution to, um, or to pass uh, um, uh, the resolution for the state of South Dakota to support the Remove the Stain Act and just using these pseudosciences. And the example I used there was saying in basic you know, English that what took modern science two centuries to comprehend and what they call um, microbiomes or gut health, I said, my takoja, who just was here earlier, she knows that's tkhaniga. Because why did we eat the guts? Because when the buffalo ate the grass, and the grass was healthy because the soil was untainted, the ground, the nerd, was, it was, was not spoiled by all these contaminants from the bombing range to the runoff to the min mining that runs off into the rivers and that absorbs into the soils, the grass was healthy, the prairie grass. And when the buffalo, the bison, our relatives ate it, and we ate the, the, the guts, all of the nurtri nutrients from breaking down all were absorbed into the intestines. And so that's where our microbiomes, what they call it in gut health, and it impacts your overall physical health, and that impacts your overall longevity. And I couldn't believe it that I said, well, in our, and I just looked at myself like, oh, hey. in our language, I was taught that was tchanega. Yet, yet it took washichus and pseudosciences two centuries to figure out what we already know, and it's in our language. Everything that these sciences speak about from this um, biophysics, everything that we know in the metaphysical energies, the telluric energies that are these magnometers are being used to read how our eons have energy, why the pyramids are, were made, why the chesapa is sacred, why there's different areas in the Hesapa that intersect, and because of that, the energies, the elements then are shifting, and it creates this vortex of energy, and we know that it's in our language. These are places and sacred spaces that we have known has been embedded into the language, and when we continue to perpetuate our language and continue to hand that down, and that's why I'm really, really critical, and when I came home, to, um, so I resigned or I left my positions back um, about a year ago to move back home to Wakbamani to take care of my ate because he's getting older. And so I'm out there and I just tell him, you know, geez, Dad, everything I've learned here and everything they're teaching out there in this Western world, our people already know. That's how advanced we are. But what we do need to know, and I always, you know, go to Lekshi Phil and a lot of my Tuwe's faith and... Um, Lexi, Rick, and 
I asked them, because I was raised with my Lakshi Wilmer Mastith. When he left, I was afraid. And I said, how do I move forward? And do I even have that right to move forward to study intellectual property law? Because I am only one, you know, and I am young. And I don't want to move forward without the support of my Oyate. I said, but I see what's ahead. And they're far <coughs> advanced. And when I, when I hosted um, um, in one of my former positions, um, I was the um, academic advisor for the Global Leadership School for Indigenous Women under Columbia University. And they opened up that recruitment space for me. And usually I'm only allowed to recruit one indigenous woman from North America. But this time they let me recruit seven, and four of whom were Lakota. And one of them, including Senator Red Don Foster, uh, Nakina Mills, Joni Tobacco. And um, we were able to move ahead. And why? Because they looked to the Lakota, Nakota, the Dakota, the Ocheti Shakoi, to the Oyate Omanichie. They look to you for guidance because the world is looking to you. I'm looking to you. But what we were able to do in one of the convenings, in a virtual convening, one of the unchis brought up, and it really, really triggered a thought for me you know, about who will own the future. What will that look like? But when, when I start mentioning, you know, biophysics and genetic sequencing and, you know, artificial intelligence and all of these things that I see on uh, Amazon or Netflix, and I start to realize that that could be a reality, I remembered one of the unchis saying, hmm, I wonder if that's why Tashunka Wutko refused to have his photo taken or why the um, family, you know, was very secretive. And I come from that Tioshpai, the Little Hawk. Little Hawk was Tashunka Witko's uncle. They fought beside each other during the battle of what, what I call greasy grass, our little bighorn. And when my Unchi or my Tume brought that up, it made me wonder, did he know something that we didn't? Or was he trying to tell us something? Because now today, everything's like Joe said, dig digitized. The moment that I openly speak and open my mouth and create these sound waves, this is called um, public access or open access. It's open source. It means anything I've just now shared today in this forum is now open for any public access and that any intellectual property I've just shared does not belong to me. And therefore, I cannot copyright it. I cannot patent it. I cannot trademark it. And so these are areas that I'm studying in the intellectual property world of intellectual property law, but without each of you and without all of this con collective unified force of all of our unchis, gakas, these older fluent speakers, you hold the key to instruct and advise me, to advise, I'm going to say Miss Soon, because spiritually I think I'm older than him, so therefore he's not my older brother, but to advise us, how do we move forward? Because who one day, you know, that future will be owned. And one day, you know, if the human genome can be unraveled, the double helix to be unraveled by modern science and it to be explored and exploited, and it's being used today and it's worth three hundred and eighteen billion dollars. And that was back in two thousand eighteen, I think, and the trajectory for that uh, for the rate of return for that in um, bioeconomics is, is predicted to be 100 times the rate of return. So 318 times 100. That would be the rate of return for any DNA, just one drop of blood, one hair sample. It could be my, I call it my gizzard, but my gallbladder that I just took out Mendona years ago anything. And mind you, they don't have to inform us because of these antiquated federal laws that we know keep our people oppressed. And, and I really like the notion earlier of going through an international forum, because I know Lakshi has always said, you know, we don't, we don't have to ask for anyone's permission. We don't. 
Now that's a stamp that the, you know, this uh, facade, this country, this constitution made up and they placed on us under the Marshall Trilogy. But we know we're not. Just as my Gaka had said, we are sovereign individually in our autonomy and collectively we are sovereign. So now how do we truly become economically sovereign nations? You know, and I would hope that, and I would really, um, you know, look to each of you to look at, especially the council fires, you know, each of you who hold these um, very distinguished positions because, you know, what like, like she does, you know, what each of you, you know, uh, do in these, these roles, that it's not easy. And I know you're giving of yourselves for the fate of our future generations, but now we have to think seven generations ahead so what does that mean? Who will own the DNA of the next seven generations? Will that be, how will that digital economic resource look like for tribal nations? What will that rate of return be for us? Will it promote the longevity of our human life here on Unchimaka? Will it sustain the sovereign rights because as far as I know, every antiquated federal Indian law that has been passed has been nothing but an illusion. And it's been the sheep's wool that's been pulled over our eyes under the guise of sovereignty. And I know our people are so advanced. And we know that. That's why we're all here today. Why each of you stay committed and continually finding a way around these perpetuated uh, antiquated Indian laws that do nothing but undermine our basic human rights to determine our own fate and the fate for the next seven generations. And the only thing that I can think of now, and that's why I volunteer my time with Misun here, is to look at a declaration that would be passed by the Oyate Omenichie, the Ochate Shakoi, to at least give us a stance give us something so that we are solid and strong in who we are because it will be acknowledged so long as it is, it is passed and is heard. Because this is a scary world that we're living in. And when each of you go, then you'll be up there. And it is us that will be um, shakala, down here. And I'm afraid that I can't fill those shoes. And I've done everything that you've asked of me. I've learned everything that I could. And then I've come home to serve my people. I don't take a dollar, not a penny. My integrity as a Lakota Ekche, as a Oglala, is not for sale. But I need your guidance. I need to know how we move forward. We need to know. As what, what the Biodata Consortium has done is it's given us at least a space to bring back the remains of our ancestors. And we have. It's given us an open space of dialogue for our people to come and convey their cultural concerns, our spiritual concerns. And what does that look like? That's all I know is my hope at the end of this lifetime here, this human life journey, is that I, I am able to return back to the Wichach Oyate, to walk amongst the stars with the, each of you, to be a good relative. But will I? I don't know, because I don't know what I just did with my gallbladder, to be quite honest. <laughs> but all I know is that I continue to pray every day to you know, help me move forward in a good way. Because now we're talking about, you know, not only my takoja, but the next seven generations ahead. And that's a long, a long path ahead of us to look forward. But one day that future will be owned. And it is being owned now by all the investors. And they're certainly not tribal nations. It is the majority of the 2%. Those billionaires that are out there, like Facebook, Google, these entrepreneurs that have already marginalized and exploited the digital enterprise and the data 
in biogenetics, biodiversity. So how do we keep up as the Ochati Shakoi? And I would ask that, I'm humbly ask that of each of you to please advise me, advise us in the best way, because then I won't have to waste so much time going into law school. You know, we're moving forward and learning too many of this washi chu way. You know, but I came home and I'm here and, and I just humbly am, am, am humbled and grateful that each of you are here today and that give us this time. But again, I ask you, you know, who will own the future? And did Tashunka with Go know something that we didn't? And what does that look like for the next seven generations? For now, in this capacity, all I know is that we have a space to house and protect our DNA, any genetic resources, any intellectual property, traditional knowledge, and it will be solely owned by the Ocheti Shakoi. And we have so many experts and so many knowledge keepers, so many people who can work with us to help you know, um, edit or refine this declaration. But something needs to be done because we are so far behind, extremely far behind. I'm afraid that we're just waking up in that state of uh, to be awake, to be awoken. But now we, we're in this fight for our life, this failure to survive, this, this uh, failure to thrive, and our spirituality is at stake. The sicha of our, the nachi of our future generations is at stake. So where do we go from here? And how can we do this collectively? And I turn to each of you with the utmost respect and humility. Lila wopila tukila ni chichi apehe. Amen. So I agree with her metaphor. It, it is like waking up and your house is on fire and you are driven up to the second floor and trying to figure out how you're gonna jump out the window and survive. That's kind of where we are at right now. And so just quickly with this declaration, I hope you read it. The first part is describing the rights and sovereignty of indigenous nations, uh, that we know what's happening. We know that the wool is getting pulled over our eyes. And then the second part is a list of things that we're asking the IRA governments and the federal government to do to stop it from happening. So with that, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we, are, we come to the end of the day. And we come to the end of the conference. And um, I guess the, the two brothers are gonna come up. You know, the other one, Justin, and the other one over here, Phil. So Justin and Phil, JP brothers are coming up to do the closure and um, we will end it, and then uh, before, as they were doing that, we, uh, we're going to, I'm going to smoke the pipe, and those that want to want to join in that process, uh, Ivan's going to sing the beautiful song, and then we'll light it, and then we'll, okay, the, the group will, and then I'll, those that want to come, I'll, I'll smoke it, and then we'll I'll put it away, and we'll, and, and then from there, it's been a pleasure to work with these two. They never agree on anything. <clears throat> they never come to any consensus. They play that big shot role, you know, but they're always that first one on the line, you know, when it comes to that food. So <coughs> I want to have them close and here you go. <coughs> Uh, 
Hackerchi Nakakilena Nijo Wopele Chicha Naha Takuma Kokashila, which we are picky, a honey wap you are Kagab, no woke hair, no Wolak Hota. Hena Hena Cha, you have washed Chukum Hitcher Winchare Shakoin Kircher, Ukukjum. The future uh, generations, seven generations. So, today, I think it's a huge jump. We have been working for a, a very long time, and it, it takes a lot of work to uh, put a, a good meeting together, and uh, especially to get uh, people to uh, speak on the issues. Um, there's so many. So many issues that we can't could, just couldn't get to all of them in in two days. Uh, that's why I like to um, keep Andy Andy Reid around. So, <laughs> and I do have a, a couple of uh, note takers out there uh, taking notes for us. Uh, later on, we'll be uh, able to issue some notes to the through the email. Those of you that have uh, registered. Um, these things that we are uh, uh, working on, one one of them is the most basic thing is to let's get organized. Let's create a treaty office. You create a treaty office, take the initiative. The, our worst enemy is complacency, Maraltis, Mitakipi. We will lose a lot by, by not doing anything by just being status quo back home. Uh, we have to take the initiative. Uh, a lot of times um, we have bad communication. Uh, the THPO, I need their information and uh, I'm glad we have this information with the DNA stuff, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, who we are. They want everything from us. And here we are, um, we can't even uh, uh, get the uh, President of the United States attention, even though we've uh, submitted documents, but we still keep working at it um, on and on. Uh, we, we, we have seen the land sessions, uh, we looked into that. Uh, these maps that you've seen over the um, presentations, uh, Dr. Robertson showed us that, um, what they took from us. Um, it says, but I think somewhere it says the Secretary of Interior can um, help us help us with that. Um, our our Sichangu people are, uh, have allowed me to do some things that are, are going to um, help all of us to proceed with uh, using their technology to create a uh, platform to, over our treaty land. To, to, to install sensors throughout throughout the treaty territory and to um, issue reports, uh, that layers and layers of data. I'm not the uh, expert, but it's gonna be awesome. And so we, there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, I wanna thank each and every one of you for uh, hanging in there, uh, especially through this storm. Um, this storm is a blessing because uh, the, the earth is dry, the earth is drying up. And Mujimakha uh, is heating, uh, is in a fever, khate, khalaya. And uh, um, we needed that, we needed the snow. Uh, I'm worried about the four-legged relatives out there, the, the winged, the hupahu, oyate, wamakash kanki. They could, we were even uh, talking about losing some uh, uh, species, uh, species going extinct because of climate change. I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to paint uh, doom and gloom, but we have to uh, learn how to um, plan and prepare for the climate change and what's coming. In the year 2050, the earth is gonna be a lot hotter than what we're used to, and that's our grandchildren that's gonna be alive during that time. So we need to prepare for those times. I'm glad we have, um, we have some very talented people that came through here. 
uh, very proud of uh, Uncle Jensen's um, uh, testing of the water. Uh, there's, there's some other young young people. We need to start training these young professionals, and, and to we need to also um, bring back the hochoka, the the chonupa teachings. We need to get back to that. We need to get, get back to who we are. We are assimilating faster than than uh, we are gaining any Lakota language speakers. We're we're like we're losing all in all fronts. So I, I urge you to think about that uh, in the next uh, in the next day uh, or immediately. Uh, start talking Lakota to your children. If you can't learn with them and and um, put Lakota, um, uh, I call it. I guess people call it inherent sovereignty. That is powerful. That, that is us, the, our language, our history, and our culture. We have to hold on to that. That's our sole source of sovereignty. Not everything else, but that is who we are. The hochoka, the, the ceremonies, the everything. Everything goes along with everything that we do. So I better uh, let my misu talk here. So he's falling asleep over here. So why have Kiftalo? Tukshake Mongla Koktalo. Well, thank you, Chie. Um, when I first started coming to these meetings, you know, I've learned a lot, tried to be as um, open minded as I could. And, you know, getting reelected as a fifth member for the Ogallisu tribe, I'm in for another two years. So, you know, I want to continue to work with the treaty people. I want to continue trying to get funding for our treaty office. Um, we have a proposal all written up, ready to go. We fought for last last administration to get it funded. It didn't happen, so you know we're going to keep doing it. And um, like some of the older some of the older council members that are kind of stuck in their ways. They were even approaching me saying that they understand now that we need the treaty offices, not only on our reservation, but everywhere else. So, you know, when Bryce was, Bryce was here talking, um, I know that's in him with uh, Ryman getting elected up there. I'm hoping we have someone in Eagle Butte to help push that funding for them also. Um, you know, we heard a lot of lot of lot of heavy information these last two days. Um, you know, it's a it's a lot, but it's it was, it's good information for everybody to hear. But you know, I've been talking with Phil, and we go back and forth about it. That you know, now these meetings, you know, the, these meetings have a lot of information to them, but yet we still have our concern with the Biden letter that he never acknowledged. We have our request to our tribal councils that, you know, if we're not pushing them, then we don't don't really get anywhere with them. So, you know, my dad growing me, growing up, teaching me how to get things done. He had a he had a way of putting things. And I thought about it and then I heard it, I heard another guy say it the other day, you know, if you're not gonna paint, then get off the ladder. So I think it's time now that we we have all this information. We have all our educated people. We have all our young ones coming up. We have all these studies and all these tests. How do we, how do we organize and get our message to DC? You know, if, if our tribal council don't do it, if our tribal presidents don't do it, do we have to, do we all just, you know, we go over there ourselves and sit on the front steps all day until that president hears us? Because everybody, everybody sees our situation. Everybody realizes that the Lakota way of living is what we should go back to. The buffalo, how they're not polluting like the cows do. You know, all that kind of stuff that we knew, our, our grandparents knew. They're finally realizing. So somehow we need to start painting, you know, because our kids, our grandkids, the ones coming behind us, we really, for sure, for real, 
No messing around. We're doing this for them. You know, we hear politicians say it. It's for our kids. It's for our kids. But we, you know, working with all you guys and talking to all you guys, I can see it in your hearts and your minds that this is really an important thing that we need to do right now. Because, you know, we all know that that goofy president president that left, he said he's going to run again. And Biden, you know, no guarantees he can get back in. So we have two years left. So I think it's really time we start making movement. And, you know, the, the next meeting, Phil talked about Oglala sponsoring it. Um, Hunk Papa said they wanted to do one. But, you know, I think the, I think the next meeting, the Oglala should do it. And we are going to have to, it's probably going to, maybe we have to call it a working working session instead of a conference. So we can get, you know, we can get on our horses, fix our hair, get our paint, and pick up our, pick up whatever we need to go fight this issue. So, you know, I really, all these past meetings, you know, the one we did in Bismarck, the one we did here last year, this one, the one we did in June before, we all know what we need to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit younger than most of you in here, and I, I shouldn't be talking in front of you like this, but this is what I see. And um, the older ones, they are getting up there in age, and we do need to get their teachings, and we need to show them everything that they fought for, that we're going to make movements. You know, so with that, I want to thank everybody for <coughs> staying here. The, um, GA promised a movie and popcorn, but I've been walking around outside. I didn't see no popcorn yet, so. He can't even figure out his mic. <laughs> and he turned him off. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I just want to get that message, you know. And there's, you know, there's other other things that we needed to talk about. Um, the one the knee massacre items that we brought back from Barry, Massachusetts, that led to a little bit of turbulence there. But regardless, bottom line is we have it back on the homelands. We're going to continue. And we, you know, I've been up to meetings with Hunk Papa, been to Manny and I'm hosted a uh, meeting and back at, we're in Eagle Butte. But we're, we're not making a decision on what to do with that stuff. It's, it's going to be a long time. My main, my main focus, my main goal was to... Hey, who did that? <laughs> the batteries are dying. The battery died. But um, my main goal was to get it away from them white, them white people that were displaying it like a trophy of war. So we have it back home. Now we can, we can sit down, take our time, and decide what to do with it. You know, I just want to touch a little bit on that. Um, we are going to have a doings on December 29th at the site. We're going to meet tomorrow and start working out some details. So, you know, a little, little announcement there. Again, thank everybody for hanging in here. You, you guys all taught me a lot of patience because, uh, you know, I was out, out there wandering around trying to mess around. The only casino I could hit is that little ugly one in the corner, and that, all it does is take my money and don't give me anything back. So, so with that... Um, Wopila, Doc Yase. I hope you're uh, killing the battery. Uh, before we close, uh, Wendell, we need a, a closing prayer. Uh, prayers for our relatives are traveling home. Hopefully they're not traveling, but we want to make sure that uh, we say some prayers for our uh, Oyate uh, safe journey whenever they get, get home. So. Oh, by the way, that we ran over the time of that uh, documentary, so that's canceled. The documentary is canceled. No popcorn, no soda. Oh, <clears throat> can you hear me? I'll go ahead and pray with the Chinupas for all of us and. I'll end it because um, I I don't want to leave it with the tobacco in it and as you all go. So as I pray, just remember I'm praying for everybody for a safe trip, 
home and everybody that go back home in a good spirit, your family, or those that are going to stay, you know, that, you know, for tomorrow, for the ride. But like I said, you know, we, we need to really start working together. And if, main thing is, <clears throat> you know, that it's this conference when it first started, I remember when we, uh, everybody was wanting something to happen. And so when it took off, it was packed uh, way back when, long ago. And so with that, I just wanted to say that uh, you know, after I'm done, then everybody can shake hands with each other. And then um, okay. Phil said he's going to buy extra rooms for each and every one of you. you know, hey. Hey, 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 hey,
Uh, thank you to all the tech technologists, experts that uh, kept the equipment going, and thank you to the singers for all the beautiful songs and uh, prayers and uh, the Machpia uh, Luta Tios by Oyate for the Chanupa to uh, during this meeting. So, Wopila.